Hi, I'm Bob the Hollow, and this is the Marketplace of Theories, a series where we're going to talk about other people's theories. If you haven't already, then I recommend you watch the first video in this playlist. It's called Primer, it's really short, and it lays some ground rules to how this experiment is supposed to work. In this episode, we are going to talk about Hawkshaw's theory called Ashlake, Havel, and the plot against the gods. The first thing to note about Hawkshaw is that, I'm not sure, but apparently, it's a group of people rather than a single lore hunter. Which is really cool, actually. I think Dark Souls places a lot of importance on the community aspect, and it's nice to see people exercising jolly cooperation outside the confines of the game. And their videos are very long and in-depth, so we're dedicating a whole episode to discussing a single theory this time. And man, is this a long episode. I mean, their video is almost two hours long. I knew mine would be long too, but holy shit, is this a long one. To make things easier for everyone, I divided this marathon into sections, and each section into summary and analysis. Except for the last section, that has three small theories, so they got a bit mixed up. And I'm under no illusion anyone is going to watch the whole thing in one go, so don't forget to use the timestamps and the chapters to navigate the video. And if you haven't watched their video yet, then make them sure to watch that as well. There will be a link to it in the description. Now, without further ado... Taking the scope of this theory into consideration, I think it's best to start by tracing a brief overview of its parts. The video seems to be divided into four main sections, plus a few extra theories at the end, wherein the first section is dedicated to the blacksmith deity, with whom most players are probably familiar, even though his lore has never been significantly expanded upon and also to Aedas, a character only mentioned in passing by Aveline's description. Here, they establish a flower as the signature of the blacksmith deity, use that to connect this deity to Aedas, and then connect Aedas to the Undead Rebellion and Hevel, the rock. The second section explores Hevel's last known location, the Watchtower Basement. They proposed his rebellion co-conspirators would have freed Havel from his prison and then fled into Ashlake. The third one explores Ashlake and its connection to the blacksmith deity. This also serves to loop the theory back around, creating a neat little cycle there, which was very nice, I think. And it also segues into the final section, where they talk about Sif, the scaleless. Regarding Sif, they explore a bit of the Pale Drake's lore, but he seems to be only tangentially connected to the Rebellion, according to the arguments presented by this theory. And then they conclude their venture by finishing Hevel's lore, talking about the Earl of Karin, and disclosing one last theory regarding Sigmire and Siglind. Okay, that's a good broad summary, right? I think we're ready to dive into the details now, shall we? As I mentioned, they start everything with a flower. More specifically, they start by mentioning the Chlorenthi ring found in the Great Hollow, a concept art of Gwyn, and Smoth's armor and hammer while also citing one of Miyazaki's interviews, where he says Smoves was his favorite armor set in Dark Souls 1. They draw attention to what would be flower patterns on Gwyn's armor set, and make a connection to the ring, noting its description as being ancient. 
Then they point out another set of flowers on Zmov's armor and, given the prominence of both characters, they conclude their armors were crafted by the nameless blacksmith deity. They also speculate these flower designs are forming a pattern that would indicate it to be the signature of said blacksmith deity. Next, they use lightning bolts to demonstrate the nameless blacksmith deity may have crafted ancient crossbows, since the giant blacksmith that we meet in an Orlando is specifically stated to never have seen one. In their search for a crossbow connection, they eventually arrive at Aveling. They can't find the proposed flower signature on the crossbow itself, but they trace its patterns back to the royal archives and the crystal knight standing guard in front of Sif's chambers, and assume, therefore, that this knight is Aedas himself, while also pointing out the presence of flower patterns on his armor and shield. They draw attention to Avon's description, stating it was cherished by Aedas without actually saying it was made by him. Then they draw a comparison between the intricacies of the crossbow and Zmo's armor and hammer, and another comparison between the giant cogs of the royal archives and the intricate mechanisms they must have moved and what seem like cog patterns on Zmo's armor. They also stipulate the blacksmith deity must have been a giant, and then, from all this, they conclude this deity must have built not only Aveling, but the archives itself. In this scenario, Aveling was gifted to and cherished by Aedas, who would have been an apprentice to the blacksmith deity. Then, before moving on to Havel, they close this section by claiming Sif would have been using crystallization as a means of controlling Aedas, in order to keep him crafting armors and weapons for Sif's channelers, giving the complexity of their tridents. Okay, time to start our de facto analysis of this theory. Right off the bat, we have a major problem with their usage of concept art. This is one of the rules I presented in my primer, after all. Outside sources of information aren't canon. When it comes to concept art, the problem is that it precedes the final product, meaning things can and do change between the moment when said art is drawn and the moment when whatever it's serving as an inspiration for gets finalized. These changes can be for any number of reasons, including, but not limited to, it was removed because it just didn't fit the lore anymore, or we can leave it in because it looks pretty but the lore behind it has changed, and we would be none the wiser for it, meaning we should be careful not to build our arguments on top of them. Right? Anyway, the connection they establish between Gwyn's flowers and the blacksmith deity is unfounded regardless of how much you're willing to accept concept art as a valid piece of evidence. That's because these supposed flower patterns aren't embossed on Gwyn's armor, they're embroidered on his cloth garb. The blacksmith deity was a blacksmith, not a tailor. His signature would have been placed on Gwyn's armor, not his robes. And I say supposed flower patterns because they don't really look like flowers to me, though admittedly that's quite subjective and I'm willing to accept they might be flowers. Though again, that's a moot point given my previous argument. And regarding the Clorenty ring, the assumption that it represents the blacksmith deity kinda falls apart if you take the ring at city into consideration. There, the ring is being presented by Gwyn to the pygmies in a set of statues preceding Filianor's church. Filianor's spear ornament was woven with a crest of young grass, and the young grass dew calls such crest a green young grass crest. 
So, Philenor's crest was that of a young green grass. The Clorenty ring symbolizes Philenor herself, and those statues symbolize Gwyn leaving Philenor under the care of the pygmies. This also explains why the ring is described as being ancient, since it has existed since the times of the Ringed City. It just makes no sense for it to be the symbol of the blacksmith deity within this context. So, with all that being said, I just don't think this flower connection holds any water, you know? And then there's Mo. The first thing they point out here is that A symbol that is on Gwyn's armor we find on Smoth's. You can see it quite clearly here. This is unmistakably the same as the symbol on Gwyn's. But that's just not the same symbol. They're just different. And you can choose to give it some leeway, saying they're not the same but they're similar enough, sure but it's supposed to be his signature, and they repeatedly comment on how much of a master blacksmith the blacksmith deity was, and on how careful Miyazaki was with the design of all the armors. Surely, if they were meant to be the same symbol, they just have made them the same symbol. Such as with Adas when he comes up in a little bit. The flowers on Adas's armor really do look like the one on his shield, but from Gwyn to Small to Adas, I think they're just clearly different. And, quite honestly, a flower is too generic a symbol to claim it forms such a specific pattern, unless they all look exactly the same, which they don't. They also quote Miyazaki saying, There's something unnatural about Smoth's armor. It doesn't look like something that would have been created by a normal, sane human. I think that's what I like about it. But we'll come back to this when it becomes relevant. And about the closed petals they see around Smoth's armor and hammer, they just look more like teeth to me. I mean, he was most notably known for eating his victims, right? That just seems too befitting to be ignored. You know? And just a neat picky quick side note before moving on. After analyzing these two armors, they state that Given the uniformity of the mark amongst several godlike sets, we can begin to infer the origins of some of these works of art. This is meant to reaffirm the pattern created by the flower markings, given that it can be found in several instances, as they put it. But I would like to point out that Chu is a far cry from several. The choice of words here seems misleading to me. Probably not on purpose, but still, it's not several, it's just Chu. This in and of itself doesn't negate the possibility of a pattern, should there be one. But a pattern of Chu is much less conclusive than a pattern with several examples. Again, I know this is nitpicky of me, but they could have chosen their phrasing a bit better here. And this whole bit about Smoke's flowers specifically, it's admittedly more subjective than the first bit, but in the end, since it's dependent on the first flower connection, then there just isn't any basis for its initial assumption. There's no reason to start considering these as valid arguments to begin with, since there's no connection to be made between the Clorenty ring and the flower patterns to the nameless blacksmith deity. And now on to Adas, Havelin and the Royal Archives. As previously mentioned, they use this pattern present on Havelin, the archive's decoration and the armor of the Crystal Knight, to deduce that this knight is Adas. And I'm sorry, but I'll just have to refute this conclusion. First, because the singular nature of this knight is what would lend credence to the assumption that this is a singular character in-game. But this knight isn't actually unique. You can get this armor, called the Crystalline Set, 
from a corpse in the gardens before the crystal cave. Its description states that it was worn by a hollowed knight who was partially crystallized. There were more than one of these knights. We don't know how many, but definitely more than one. And their armor shares that symbol with Aveling because the archives was, in all likelihood, really under the care of Aedas. Their armors didn't have that symbol because they were Aedas, they had that symbol because they worked for Aedas. And the second reason I have to disagree with this conclusion is that Aedas probably died a natural death a long, long time ago. Avelin is an instrument showcasing an intricate set of mechanisms, not unlike the moving staircases of the archives. Similar ingenious feats of engineering can also be found in an Orlando, in the eternally moving elevators and the rising tower-like platform that connects the city's entrance to its cathedral. His design contributions to the building of the city were what secured him enough prestige to look over the archives. All these means the archives were built contemporaneously to the city, and that, in turn, means Aedas was alive during the height of the Age of Fire. No fading, no one death, just eternal gods and mortal humans. So, unless a more violent demise had brought Aedas' life to a premature end, of which there's no indication and therefore no reason to assume it happened this way, then the only logical conclusion is that Aedas died of old age, long before the first flame began to wane. Regarding Aveling, let's start by pointing out that its original Japanese description says it was made by Aedas, and that it has no mention of it being cherished. That should bring closure to their discussion regarding the origin of this weapon, right? The blacksmith deity didn't make this crossbow, Aedas did. This also allows us to skip the etymology argument they made regarding its name, which is good because they were stretching it a little bit there and I really didn't wanna have to reply to it. And it also gives us a reason to talk about their association process. They mentioned in the video Aedas may have been the creator of Aveling, but ultimately settled on the blacksmith deity. And while a blacksmith can have a more complex knowledge than what's necessary for forging a sword, for instance, both Aveling and the rotating staircases of the archives are intricate feats of engineering that had to be designed from scratch. They even draw comparisons between Aveling and Smolf's hammer, but there are no comparisons to be made here. One is a large heap of metal, glued to a long stick. The other is basically science fiction at this point in time. There just isn't any clear indication the blacksmith deity would have been able to create that. Case in point, he didn't. Aedas did. The connection they make between the blacksmith deity and Aveling showcases the leaps they're willing to take in their association process, which is usually not a good sign, since it can lead to unfounded conclusions. Likewise, they land on the blacksmith deity as being a master mason who would have built the archives as well. And again, he's a blacksmith in God, not a god of all crafts ever. Masonry is beyond the scope of his job description, and there's nothing to indicate he'd have branched out in this direction. And I'm not saying he couldn't have, I'm just saying there's nothing indicating that he did, so there's also no reason to assume that he did. And with all that being said, the cog symbol they mention in Smolf's armor seems to me like a generic variation of the other symbols present in that same armor. When it comes to Aedas's continued service under Sif's command, making armors and weapons for the channelers, first I'd have to remind you Aedas most likely died a long time ago, 
Then I'd have to draw attention to the moonlight butterflies. They too have what seems like an intricate device on their backs. A set of eternally spinning mechanisms, very similar to what we've seen thus far. This indicates Sif has not only studied the trove of knowledge left behind by Adas, but also mastered it enough to make similar creations of his own. I mean, there's no reason not to believe Sif created the Moonlight Butterflies, right? So, there's also no reason not to believe he designed the mechanisms for the Channeler's Tridents either. And this is where we go back to that Miyazaki quote about Smoke's armor. There's something unnatural about Smoke's armor, it doesn't look like something that would have been created by a normal sane human. Because I don't get it. Like, first they claim the blacksmith deity made that armor, with which I agree, he made armors and weapons for the gods, he probably made Smoke's armor. Then they quote Miyazaki saying it looks like it wouldn't have been made by a sane person, which I think is another instance of people taking Miyazaki's vague and or figurative answers and adding literal meaning to them. But I digress. And in the end, they theorize Adas was driven partly insane by crystallization, which seems to be implying he's the one who made Smoke's armor, in the context of that quote. So, what then? Did they change their mind about who made Smoke's armor? Or are they saying the blacksmith deity also went insane? There seems to be no internal logic to these claims when they're placed together. And unless whoever made that armor had also decided Ornstein was going to look like a lion, then Small is the insane one who would have settled on that armor's appearance. I don't know, man. This bit about the quote just kinda lost me there. The idea that crystallization may be used as a form of mind control is interesting though, I'll say that much. Greenhued staff instantly comes to mind. And having reached the end of this section, I gotta say that, unfortunately, I just don't think this portion of their theory has any legs to stand on. From the flower signature, to waiters in the royal archives, every aspect of it seems easily refutable and built upon insubstantial speculations. And the fact this is the basis for a lot of what follows doesn't bode particularly well for this theory, I would say. But as always, I urge you to watch their video and give it your full consideration if you haven't already. There are two sides to this conversation and you should listen to both. Now, where were we? Ah, yes, the rock. Here they start to unravel their theories regarding Hevel, the rock. The first order of business is speculating about the placement of the Black Knights, which they suggest is linked to locations related to the Undead Rebellion. They draw particular attention to the first one we meet, in the Undead Burg, close to the body from which we loot the blue Tearstone Ring. According to their theory, the Burg is where the plot against the gods was planned, and that body belongs to one of the conspirators, who was betrayed and assassinated. Then they disclose their theory about how Havel was trapped in the tower to begin with. They point to the collapsed walkway found opposite to that assassinated corpse, which apparently leads into Havel's tower. And they also mention a boarded-up residence in that same hallway that could have belonged to the conspirators. Their conclusion is that Havel walked into the tower through that walkway, which was then destroyed, trapping him inside. Next, they talk about the watchtower basement key, the friend who would have imprisoned Havel within, and the question of who betrayed him. Here, they go over the locations of Black Knights again 
then point out the placement of the grass crest shield, which was previously associated with Adas, and what they call a secretive bonfire, as hints that Hevel's partners in crime may have attempted and succeeded in a plot to free him. To expand upon this conclusion, they start by mentioning Hevel's followers' faith in him, as mentioned by Hevel's ring's description, they also make a note saying that the Hevel we fight in the tower is easily defeated, that Hevel's weapons are found in an Erlondo, and lastly, they say perhaps the most important is the most enigmatic of Hevel item description changes in the Japanese. The change they're talking about is in the Watchtower Basement Keys description, where they claim the mention of a rumor which in English emphasized the friend, in Japanese, would be related to his continued imprisonment instead. Their translation ends in, it is said he has been shut in there ever since, which they believe to be an indication that there are widespread rumors doubting whether or not Hevel is still locked in his tower. Finally, they conclude that the doubt that's been cast on the identity of the person trapped in the tower means Hevel has been replaced by one of his followers. Other than the rumor, they also present as evidence for this escape the collateral damage that may have been left behind. Starting with what they believe to be the corpse of Ferris, who was in a prime position to give covering fire during the escape, the bonfire that would have provided replenishment, the lift leading down to the Valley of Drakes, New Londo and Blytow, plus Ash Lake. The presence of the Grasscrest Shield, which they believe to be associated with the Rebellion, and a Black Knight as well. And they point out the possible connection between Ferris, whose armor is worn by one of Ovinus' hunters, and Ulasil, which they believe to have taken part in the Rebellion too. Having established Hevel's escape from the tower, they make a note regarding its timeline. To this effect, they mention the corpses of rebels littering the entrance to Nito's arena and the divine blacksmith in Darkroot Garden, stating the battle in both locations would have to have taken place at different times, meaning they probably sought to free Hevel first, who was possibly their leader, before launching their full assault. And the last point made in this section of their theory concerns the fabled betrayer, who they believe was possibly Prince Ricard. They mention he was also undead, that he guards both a rare ring of sacrifice and a divine blessing, which could hint at him operating as a double agent. And also that the crestfallen merchant doesn't list him among those who had failed in traversing Saint's fortress meaning he could just be trapped there. And I believe that's it about Hevel from their part for now, which means we can start talking about it too. Let's start with the setting for this segment of their theory. When it comes to the idea that the planning of the plot against the gods was also largely carried out secretively in the undead Berg, I'll start by saying I do agree some of the comings and goings of the Rebellion must have taken place in the Burg, yes. It's functionally a hub between New Londo and Honor Londo. It's human enough for humans to gather in and poor enough for such gatherings to not draw too much attention. And, of course, Havel is there. The problem comes from thinking this was the central hub for the rebellion, and similarly, also from the corresponding notion that Hevel may have been its leader. I think this rebellion had a much larger scope than what the Hawkshaw team gives it credit for. First, I don't understand why they assume New Londo wasn't a part of it. I took a quick look at their timeline video and there they mention the rebellion and the flooding of New Londo happened far apart from each other, with the rebellion coming at a much later date. But I didn't see any evidence being presented to that end. And it was just a quick look though, so if I missed something, please let me know. 
Also, they believe Ulasiu may have been involved with the rebellion, and that the flooding happened after the fall of Ulasiu. So, according to what they're proposing, the rebellion happened both before and after the flooding of New Londo. But New Londo, a human city ruled by kings who entered a covenant with Kaf and had an army of dark wraiths, had nothing to do with the rebellion that was happening both before and after its fall? It doesn't make sense to me. Personally, I think New Londo was not only involved with the rebellion, but also one of its driving forces. Spurred by Kaf and working with other parties, sure, but still serving as the brunt of what would have been their invading force. With this in mind, we can also infer the participation of Velka. So now we have four kings, a primordial serpent and a goddess of sin. I honestly don't see how one Hevel the Rock, as badass as he might have been, could stand out as the leader of this ragtag band of misfits. And lastly, Hevel's participation was likely a small part of a larger institutional effort by the way of White itself. The biggest indication of this fact, in my opinion, is simply that the occult upgrade path branches off from the divine upgrade path. Figuratively, that's quite on the nose, if I may say so myself. In practice, it means that those who developed this weapon reinforcement technique had to have come from a background where they dealt with divine upgrades, that is, the way of white. They even mention it themselves that the Divine Blacksmith in Darkroot Garden may have been involved with the rebellion. And let's not forget the other Divine Blacksmith in the Tomb of Giants, the place where the rebellion sought to acquire Nito's power, which I believe to have been the right of kindling. So now, two out of two Divine Blacksmiths are also involved. Not to mention Petrus and Oswald, right? Let us not forget Petrus and Oswald. They should be indication enough that there's something rotten within the ranks of the Way of White, I think. So, yeah, I think there were tactical reasons for having some rebellion-related dealings happen in the Burg, but I don't think there's any indication the Burg would have been its headquarters or that Hevel would have been its leader. And when it comes to explaining how Hevel was trapped in the tower, they first draw particular attention to the body with the blue tearstone ring. The body seems to have been dragged to its current position, judging by the bloodstains that precede it. And as I mentioned before, they conclude this was one of Hevel's co-conspirators, who was assassinated, that the boarded-up residence in the hallway belonged to the rebels, and that the collapsed walkway in the opposite end of the hallway is the means by which they managed to trap Havel in the tower. The walkway theory seems solid at first, and it would make the assumption that the corpse belonged to a rebel that much more reasonable. But the thing is, they ask in the video whether those two doors at the top and the base of Havel's section of the tower were the only entrances leading there. And the answer is yes. The walkway simply does not lead to Hevel's prison. This can be easily confirmed by just going inside the tower and looking around. There just aren't any other exits there. From Software could have easily placed a doorway blocked by rubble if they wanted to like they did with the stairway leading to the top of the tower, but they didn't. I don't know where that passage leads to, but it isn't anywhere connected to Hevel's predicament. Same general structure? Yes. Hevel himself? No. So that kinda completely negates this portion of their theory, and this doesn't necessarily have to mean the corpse with the ring isn't of a rebel, given its proximity to the tower, 
but its placement is no longer directly connected to Hevel, meaning this argument just lost a lot of its structural integrity as well. So, now that they've gone over how Hevel would have been imprisoned, they get into their theory that Hevel would have been set free. There are some forwards and arguments preceding the main theory that we'll get back to, but first, let's talk about the Watchtower Basement Key. They first mention this key by saying perhaps the most important is the most enigmatic of Hevel item description changes in the Japanese, by which they mean that in the English description's phrase, there are rumors of a hero turned hollow who was locked away by a dear friend. The Japanese particle translated as rumor is related to the last sentence instead, which they have translated as it is said he has been shut in there ever since. And I want to start with the key because the whole basis for the idea of an escape is what they perceive as a shadow of doubt being cast upon the identity of the man trapped in the tower, and they arrive at it through the basement key. Regardless of the order in which the arguments are presented, the key is the point of origin. The key casts the shadow of a doubt that would hint at an escape. Everything else is meant to explain how said escape would have happened, not to support the idea that it happened in the first place. They repeat this point I'm making later in the video, saying we believe that this description implies that there has been a plot to free Havel. And so the phrase, it is said he has been locked in there ever since, comes along. The combination of all these factors which cast doubt on the identity of the man in the watchtower leads us to believe that while Havel may have originally been locked in, now there is a faithful follower of Havel taking his place. No, the Japanese particle they are referring to is Toyu. This is common enough in the Japanese language, and even though it can have many different meanings, in this case, yes, it would be best translated as it is said that yada yada yada. But this is just a figure of speech. This isn't meant to cast doubt on anything. It doesn't stand out at all in this description, especially considering the fantasy setting in which it is found. And the existence of Toyu isn't even unique within Dark Souls 1's item descriptions. To give you an idea of how commonplace this is, here's a list of Dark Souls 1's item descriptions that use the same phrasing in Japanese. The Paladin Set, Hevel Set, the Great Lord Set, and the Symbol of Avarice, the Great Lord Greatsword, Uchigatana, Grant, the Dragon Tooth, the Claws, the Moonlight Butterfly Horn, Pierce Shield, and Sanctus. Prism Stones, the Peculiar Doll, Firekeeper's Souls, Soul of the Moonlight Butterfly, Dragon Scales, the Archive Tower Cell Key, and the Key to New London Ruins. The Cat Covenant Ring, the Ring of Steel Protection, the Ring of the Evil Eye, and the Wolf Ring, and, of course, the Watchtower Basement Key. So, according to their arguments, are we to assume that all of these items have a shadow of a doubt being cast upon what's been asserted in their descriptions? I don't think so. That's just unreasonable. And so, just as there's no reason to believe there are widespread rumors doubting what's said in all these items' descriptions, there's also no reason to believe that are widespread rumors doubting Hevel has been shut in there ever since. And without that, there's no reason for any of this. If there's no reason to doubt the man in the tower is Hevel, then Hevel is still in the tower. And if Hevel is still in the tower, then, obviously, Hevel did not escape. This theory has no basis to stand on. And very quickly about the man in the tower, I'd like to say their claim that he is rather easily killed is very dismissive of my personal plight trying to kill him the first time I opened up that door and ran face first into his giant club goes boink. Seriously though, Hevel does become easier to kill with practice, but that's the same for all other enemies as well. Does that mean most bosses are frauds too? 
not to mention Hevel is specifically stated to have gone hollow, which certainly would have had a detrimental effect on his fighting prowess. And, uh, well, there's also their fear of flames argument. It is stated that undead are afraid of fire, yet the man in the watchtower returns to his place, looks up, and stares at the torch. Hardly the behavior of a typical undead. And to that, I say the many torch building and firebomb throwing undead in this game would like to have words with you, my good sirs. Okay, so that should be enough to basically undo this theory, right? Since the one thing that led them to contemplate any of this just doesn't scan. And with that out of the way, we are free to start talking about the other individual arguments presented here. Regarding their supposed escape route, I think they got that a little bit backward. Like I said, I think New Londo was involved in the rebellion. And from New Londo we have easy access to both bells that must be rung to open the gates of Saints Fortress, should such gates be closed. And the lift leading upward to Darkwood Basin also provides easy access to both the Undead Burg and Saints Fortress itself. I mean, this is the very same lift they mentioned in their escape route, and it was clearly built by New Londo, judging by the statues adorning its shaft. So, yeah, I agree this route was used by the Rebellion, but I don't think it was meant to get them out of the Burg. I think it was meant to covertly get them into the Burg, and when the time came, to Saint's Fortress and the City of Gods Beyond. When they talk about this route, they also mention the Grass Craft Shield and the Black Knight, and what they believe is the Corpse of Ferris. The Corpse of Ferris, I just don't think, is the Corpse of Ferris. They jump to this assumption from the presupposition Hevel had escaped, something I've addressed already, and the fact this corpse has the letter set and a longbow. The letter set, of course, is associated with Ferris, but it isn't exclusively associated with him. One of our own starting classes begins with the letter set, for instance. The hat and the black bow are specific to Ferris, but the rest of the set isn't. And this corpse doesn't even have the hat and the black bow. It has no hat and a regular bow instead. The hat and the black bow are in the possession of the forest hunter archer in Darkroot Garden. So, it stands to reason Ferris had already died, and his belongings made their way into the hands of the forest hunter. And also that this corpse is, in fact, not Ferris at all. And considering the proximity to forest hunter territory, its placement isn't even that strange to begin with. And just a quick one saying that regarding the covering fire Ferris was supposed to provide, how's a longbow meant to cover the tower from here? Doesn't seem possible to me. Regarding the Grass Crest Shield, which apparently makes kind of a set with the Chloranty Ring, given the flower pattern and stamina boosting properties, I've already covered that in the first section, when talking about Ada's and the blacksmith deity. This shield does make a logical counterpart for the Chloranty Ring, yes, but the Chloranty Ring was not the symbol of the blacksmith deity, it was originally the symbol of Filianor. Now, taking into consideration the reverence Olasil had shown to Filianor, which is demonstrated by Half-Light and the other missionaries they sent to her cathedral, and also the befitting correlation between the imagery evoked by the ring and the natural scenery associated with Ulasil. Then I believe the most logical assumption is that the symbol became associated with said land of Ulasil and later with Darkroot Garden, up to a point. 
This explains the placement of both the grass crest shield in the Arcwood Basin and the Clorante Ring in the Great Hollow, since the ring is found alongside a colony of mushrooms who survived the fall of that ancient land of sorceries. I will concede that there's a remarkable similarity of patterns and motif between the Grass Crest Shield and Crystalline Shields, though. And since Ulasil is the earliest recorded human civilization in Lordran, I'll take that to mean Aedas was an Ulasil citizen before relocating to Anor Londo. And when it comes to the Black Knight, I am kinda inclined to agree their placement creates a pattern with locations associated with the Undead Rebellion, yes. But I had also agreed this location had been used by said Rebellion, even if not with the purpose presented in this video. So that doesn't create any kind of conflict here. The problem I have here is with two of the assumptions they make. First, there's Andre. They speculate Andre may have been a part of the rebellion and that the Black Knight is keeping watch over him. But if that were the case, then surely the Black Knight wouldn't just stand around looking at Andre. The Black Knight would be going all stabby stab on Andre's undead dirty ass. And second, there's the Nameless King. He'll come up again soon and we'll talk more about it soon. But they start insinuating here that NK may have sided with the rebellion. They make both these assumptions in the same breath, saying perhaps Andre is being trapped and watched over, as the Black Knight also keeps an eye on the shrine of the firstborn son for any stray followers. But there's no indication NK would have harbored such ill intent toward his father's legacy. His last farewell was a very kind and heartfelt gesture, in my opinion. This is further corroborated by N.K. later wearing a crown that resembles that of his father, which, in turn, demonstrates both devotion and respect. And, if he had participated in the Undead Rebellion against the gods, then he'd have murdered Gwendolyn as soon as he first set up shop in Arch Dragon Peak. But he didn't because he did not, in fact, participate in such rebellion against the gods. Well, that pretty much covers this section. And, unfortunately, the assumption they had built their theory of an escape upon, the basement key casting doubt on the identity of the man in the tower, was kind of baseless. And that just kinda makes the entirety of this theory somewhat of an unnecessary exercise. Like, without that assumption, there's no reason to even consider the possibility of an escape, right? And there are only two minor points we still need to cover before moving on. When they mention the corpses littering the entrance to Nito's arena, which they believe to be the corpses of rebels, and the Divine Blacksmith in Darkroot Garden, which may have been killed by Sif due to his participation in the rebellion and compounds with their proposed escape plan. They say these represent two battles fought by the rebels at two different times, since There cannot be a raging battle in Darkroot at the same time when the same members are rebelling against the gods. Therefore, the battles must have been at different times, and we believe the rebels would rescue Havel, who was perhaps their leader, before launching the full assault against the gods. First, that kinda makes no sense to me. There's no reason why they couldn't fight two battles at the same time. That's like saying the Germans couldn't be fighting the British because they were fighting the Russians at the same time. And also, well, there are baby skeletons in this place. Why, though? Why would the rebels bring babies to their assault against the gods? The answer is, of course, they didn't, because these aren't the corpses of rebels. This was most likely a community that lived here and worshipped Nito. Some of them are even positioned as if praying toward Nito. 
that is corroborated by the father, mother and child triad represented by the pinwheels. And they were most likely trapped here when the golden barrier was instituted, which is a bit of a grim fate for so many children, come to think of it. But this is Dark Souls, right? So, yeah, best not to dwindle here for too long, I think. And lastly, we have Undead Prince Ricard, who they believe to have been the one that betrayed the rebellion and got Hevel trapped in the Watchtower. As previously mentioned, they state that being undead may have brought him to the rebellion, that he guards both a rare ring of sacrifice and a divine blessing, which may hint at a double agent, and that the crestfallen merchant doesn't mention him as having failed to traverse Saint's fortress. That's not much to go on, but they do admit it in the video that this assumption is a speculative guess, though. So, instead of spending time with these few arguments, I'll just point to Silver Knight Leto as an alternative to the role of the friend who locked up Hevel, as described in The Watchtower Key. The series introduced a character that is specifically stated to have been a friend of Hevel's, the only one ever to match the description in the key, I might add. So, I don't see any reason to ignore that as the most likely candidate for this role. And since he's an invader in the Abyssal Swamp, then I think it's fair to assume he partook in some good old rebellion back in the day as well. The Hawkshaw team even says at one point that Perhaps the friend justified the action as saving Havel's life, as the plot would have gotten them all killed anyway. So, yeah, that's pretty much the reason Lito locked him up, then he left, and then we killed him. And that is the end of the road for now. Next, we'll get into the lore surrounding Nash Lake and a bit more about the blacksmith deity as well. Before doing that, though, I just wanna say a few words here. I would like to point out that the two sections we've covered so far are the foundation for their entire theory. All the rest is built upon what's already been presented here. And as I hopefully have shown, from the blacksmith deity's flower signature to Aedas to Hevel's escape, their entire foundation is brittle at best. And if that's the case, then there isn't much left to validate whatever else may follow. We will cover the entire video and all of their arguments for the sake of being both thorough and fair, but I want you to keep this in mind as we move forward. Okay, everybody all caught up? Good, so let's get this thing going again. In this here third section of their video, the Hawkshaw team is concerned with Hevel and the other rebels escaping into Ash Lake. They also use this setting to circle back and expand upon their theories regarding the nameless blacksmith deity. They present some pieces of evidence that would trace their path down to the lake, starting with the illusory walls of the Great Hollow which they compare to the illusory wall hiding Hevel's gear in an Orlando. While also mentioning the magic behind such walls is likely derived from Ulasil. Inside the hollow, they mention the Chlorenty Ring, the great concentration of crystal lizards that drop twinkling titanites, which they remark must be peeled from a slab and received a special power the mushrooms and what they call the likely collusion of some members of Ulasil and the plot against the gods, the clams, who also drop twinkling titanite, and the basilisks, which they associate with the depths, a place where they believe former rebels were banished into. With this list, 
they've set up the trail of breadcrumbs leading to Ash Lake and they can start talking about the lake proper. They make a connection between the path of the Dragon Covenant, the Nameless King and the Blacksmith Deity. They assume the Dragon Covenant, which was joined by the Firstborn Son, likely came down to Ash Lake. They point out N.K. had Demon Titanite by his bedside, and that close to that room is one of the strongest Titanite demons in the game. Since the Nameless King was said to have respect only for arms, they propose he might also have had respect for the king among weapon craftsmen, the Nameless Blacksmith Deity. They also connect them through their shared title of Nameless and since N.K. had fraternized with the dragons, they argue the blacksmith deity may have done so as well. And from all of this, they conclude that the skull in Ash Lake is the skull of the nameless blacksmith deity. To help corroborate this point, they first argue that the rune on a titanite chunk translates as yew tree, which in Norse mythology are the trees which held up the earth and the heavens. They use this translation to speculate titanite might come from arch trees, and that the nameless blacksmith deity may have harvested them. May have harvested them? Harvest. Harvested. 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 <laughs> and that the nameless blacksmith deity may have harvested them Harvested that. <laughs> Harvested that. Harvested them. Harvested that. <laughs> Harvested. <laughs> and that the nameless blacksmith deity may have harvested them himself harvested them himself <clears throat> fuck okay uh. <laughs> uh. they <sighs> they also make a set of arguments meant to strengthen the connection between the blacksmith deity and the titanite demons they point out that Titanite demons use lightning attacks, which would support the idea this deity was related to Gwyn, that their catchpoles resemble the tongs a blacksmith would employ in their craft, that the fact they are crippled is reminiscent of the depiction of Hephaestus, the Greek god of smithing, and may imply the blacksmith deity was lame of leg as well. And finally, that the deity made and fixed the weapons of the gods, while, similarly, Demon Titanite is used to reinforce the weapons of the gods. By strengthening this connection between creator and creature, they are able to speculate that the blacksmith deity was represented by the Titanite demons to some extent. To drive the point home, they assert that the Titanite Demon is faceless, and the skull in Ash Lake is bodiless, and also that all the living giants that we meet have their faces covered. Perhaps at the bottom of Ash Lake is the uncovered skull of the giant nameless blacksmith deity. Next, they make the case for the blacksmith deity belonging to the race of giants. They go about it on two fronts. One is the description of the crystal limber. The other is a possible relationship to the Witch of Isalith. Regarding the crystal limber, they make note that the word blacksmiths is written in plural form, and then make the case that the position of the apostrophe in this description means these are the blacksmiths of a giant god. Otherwise, it would say God's giant blacksmiths and also that, regardless of this interpretation, it's most likely that if all the blacksmiths are giants, then their god would be a giant too. Regarding the relationship to Isleth, 
they go back to the Hephaestus analogy and propose that, since that Greek god was married to Aphrodite, a goddess of love who cheated on him, then maybe the blacksmith deity was married to Fina, who cheated on him as well. Then what they describe as Fina's alliance with Xanthus king Jeremiah, who they believe to have been Isaliph's husband, would have driven the spurred lovers into each other's arms. They expand upon this notion through the location of the titanite demons, noting they can be found in places to which the deity was connected to, and that one such demon resides in Isaliph. The correlation between demons of chaos and titanite demons is also brought into consideration, which they then use to speculate upon the parentage of Sicily's discharge, claiming his size can be more easily explained if the blacksmith deity was its father, and by taking the size of the skull in Ash Lake as a point of reference. At this point, they deliver a veritable cavalcade of smaller arguments in quick succession. So, forgive me for rushing through this list. I promise we'll get back to them shortly. They bring Gwyn's children into the story by claiming they had sided with Isolif, naming the Sunlight Meadows, dropped by Sunlight Maggots, and a painting of Isolif in N.K.'s room plus the fact we never had married a flame god and the divine blessings found in lost Isolif. They mention flower motifs in Isolif to speculate the blacksmith deity had used his masonry skills to build that kingdom. They remind us the crystal lizards in the Great Hollow also drops labs, which became heirlooms of the deity and that it'd be weird for him to give them to the lizards if he didn't pass in the vicinity. That the Great Hollow is one of the few places where prism stones have any value and that trading one with Snuggly yields demon titanite, and that maybe he was related to Smo, which explains why he had such a fancy armor, and that the fact he ground the bones of his victims is a vague allusion to the death of the blacksmith deity and the absence of his bones in Ash Lake. And the final step in the current line of thought comes in the form of Snuggly, the crow. Here, they go over the trades you can make with this character, showing they aren't as random as they seem. The relevant ones are trading Dung Pie for Demon Titanite, which alludes to the death of the deity by poisoning, the Egg Vermifuge for a Dragon Scale, further connecting Isolith to Ash Lake, the aforementioned Prism Stone that nets you Demon Titanite, the Sunlight Maggot for the Old Witch's Ring, and the Xanthus Crown for the Ring of Favor and Protection. And just as Nugly marks the end of the section for them, it also marks the beginning of rebuttals for us. And just as they did, we'll also get started with the breadcrumbs in the Great Hollow. As I have just said, they started this section with a list that creates a trail of breadcrumbs leading into the Great Hollow and Ash Lake beyond. The first item on the list are the illusory walls and their connection to both the Rebellion and Ulasil. On the matter of Ulasil, I'll present no objections to the idea that it may have been the origin for such crafts. There is no hard evidence for it, but it does seem like a reasonable assumption to me. The problem, I find, is first in the Ulasil Rebellion connection. As I have stated, I believe New Londo to have been an integral part of the Rebellion and, since New Londo was undeniably built after the fall of Ulasil, then Ulasil could not have been a part of the same Rebellion. Dark Raves even dropped Titanite's labs which I'll expand upon later, but seems like something they should have taken into account when making these claims, giving the framework of their own theory. And 
there are a bunch of other such walls seemingly unrelated to the rebellion. Gwendolyn uses a variation of it, All Souls in Fortress, the Catacombs and Lost Isleaf, and most notably, considering everything they've presented thus far, there are no illusory walls in the Undead Burg. If, as they put it, these were largely the domain of the Rebellion, then, in light of their previous arguments, surely there'd be some in the Burg to hide all manner of secrets, but there aren't. And, in the same list, they also mention both the Chloranthi Ring and the Mushroom Clan, one definitely and the other probably associated with Ulasil. If illusory walls were created from Ulasilian magic, and if there are citizens from Ulasil inside the Great Hollow, then... There's no need to inject the Rebellion in this equation, right? Shit hit the fan back in Ulasil, some of them left. This very same video has shown the Great Hollow and Ulasil aren't that far apart, and there's fungal growth all around the inside of the Hollow, making it a very inviting hiding place for the Mushroom people. Then, these former citizens of Ulasil used Ulasilian magic to hide themselves from the world. Bada bing, bada boom, no rebellion needed. About the deaths, I honestly don't know why they think it's supposed to be specifically associated with the rebellion, instead of just a place where they started sending all their undesirables. Especially during the chaos ensuing with the rise of the undead curse and the prominent banditry that came with it, as demonstrated by the lower undead burg. With that being said, they only mention this in passing and never come back to it, so I'll leave it open. And about the great magic barrier found in Ash Lake that they mention at one point, there's a dragon there as it will later become relevant, and that's a miracle used by Havel and his followers. And uh, they all seem to have a beef with dragons, carrying dragon teeth around and all that. It just doesn't seem that strange to me that one such follower would want to check that out, if he had caught wind of any rumors regarding a living ancient dragon somewhere. And, within the context of their own theory, if this had been one of the rebels killed in defense of their souls in Alamo, wouldn't there be a black knight here? Probably, right? So, we kinda rushed through this list, but I think we addressed every item on it, and the reason for having rushed through it is because the idea of Hevel's escape had already been discredited. And now that we've gone through it, I think this list as well doesn't really stand up to scrutiny, making it of little use to change my mind about the lore we've already covered. Well, moving on, after this brief introduction they get to Ash Lake proper, and the rest of this section is dedicated to their theory that the skull found there belonged to the nameless blacksmith deity. To this end, there's one set of arguments that I see as the foundation for this assumption, then another set meant to place the deity in Ash Lake, and another one meant to show he was a giant. The foundation comes from titanite demons being depicted as headless creatures. To place him there, they used Twinkling Titanites in Titanite's labs, the Chloranthi Ring, and established connections to the Nameless King and Isleaf. To prove he was a giant, they used the Crystal Amber's description and also the same connection to Isleaf as before, keeping in mind that proving he was a giant helps to place him in Ash Lake, and with another connection between NK and Isolif to strengthen the whole lot. These arguments aren't all presented in a strict order, but I'll group them by their purpose to make my response easier to understand. 
Now, I know this will seem a bit counterintuitive, but I'll save the foundational argument for last, as it ties in with the last point they make prior to exploring Snuggly the Crow. So, let's start with placing the blacksmith date in Ash Lake instead. The three points made here are the Titanites, the Ring, and the connections to NK and Isolith. I've covered the ring before, so we can skip that. Then, the biggest argument regarding Titanite comes from the U3 rune. As they point out, this is the translation of the rune on Titanite chunks, meaning slabs might come from trees, and, furthermore, it might also correlate to Norse mythology, which would indicate these were arch trees such as the ones found in Ash Lake. And this leads them to believe the deity may have had to harvest slabs in Ash Lake himself. So, the rune itself actually seems to be part of a bigger set. Back in the day, a person that goes by Scarecrow 13 translated the runic writings on the Titanite slab, and this rune is a part of what's written there indicating the significance of this particular room isn't in its isolated form, but in the full message from which it was taken from, meaning there's no reason to assume it signifies the origin of the titanite slabs. This explanation also fails to consider fully formed slabs appearing in deep layers of earth beneath Drang Lake. Seems like something you might want to explain, if you're asserting such slabs were harvested in Ash Lake. And I really need to point out their usage of Norse mythology here, as this outside source of information is the only argument linking the rune to their conclusion of slabs from arch trees, other than the rune's translation, which, as I have argued, shouldn't be taken in isolation from the whole. Beyond the rune, Another titanite-related point that places the deity in Ash Lake is the abundance of twinkling titanites, both from clams and crystal lizards. They draw attention to these shining shards of stone multiple times and emphasize its description's statement that it was specifically peeled from its lab. And since these labs came from the blacksmith deity, that would help corroborate the idea he'd not only have been to this place, but also harvested slabs here. The problem with this argument is that the Japanese phrasing translated as peeled in English is used for other pieces of titanite as well namely titanite shards, large titanite shards, and green titanite shards. I mean, it does kinda stand to reason that all titanite fragments were taken from titanite slabs, right? And lastly, there's the notion the blacksmith deity would have passed slabs directly to the crystal lizards in the Great Hollow, but Unless he personally gave slabs to everyone who's ever had a slab, and unless all crystal lizards got their titanite directly from the blacksmith deity, then there's a whole host of examples contrary to their conclusion out there, and there's no reason to assume it would have been any different here. Still on the subject of placing the blacksmith deity in Ash Lake, Next, we move to his connections to the Nameless King and Isolith. Regarding NK, they present one direct connection and a couple of circumstantial ones. The first circumstantial argument is that the Nameless King is said to have had respect only for arms, which means he may also have had such respect for the blacksmith deity. And that's fine with me. I have no problem with the claim. The problem, however, comes from the demon titanite found next to his bed in an Orlando, which is the one argument creating a direct connection between the two. 
And right now you might be wondering, what the hell do you mean his bedroom in an Orlando? And I say that because I only became acquainted with this theory very recently myself. And that was kind of my reaction to it the first time I heard of it. So, if you also don't know what this theory is about, it goes that there are two bedrooms in an Orlando. One with a painting of Guinevere and some other paintings of some other people where Silver Knights apparently won't go into. And another room with a painting of a sentinel in Isolith and Demon Titanite in a chest. So people theorize these are the bedrooms of Guinevere and the Nameless King respectively. Guinevere's room would have paintings of her family, and NK's room would have a painting of a warrior and weapon upgrading materials befitting a god of war. And I am sorry, but I think this is nonsense for a very, very silly reason. I mean, have you seen NK and Guinevere? Now, look at those beds. Those are really tiny beds. These aren't beds for the likes of the Nameless King and Guinevere. These are beds for really tiny gods. Or maybe very important human dignitaries, given their odd choice of paintings in Guinevere's supposed room. But most certainly not N.K. and Guinevere. And I told you it was silly, but this argument's silliness doesn't make it any less true. Plus, there's the fact N.K. was tripped from the annals of history, right? Why would they keep his room here then? That's not how you go about stripping someone from the annals of history. You don't keep their room all neat and tidy, with all their posters hanging from the walls and their trinkets at their bedside. It just doesn't make any sense to me. I think this is their only direct connection between NK and the blacksmith deity. And for these reasons, I just think it doesn't work. So, with that being said, their proposed connection kinda seems non-existent to me. And just a quick side note. Did you know those odd paintings in Guinevere's supposed bedroom are copies and slight adaptations of real-world paintings? I'll leave a link to that in the description. Okay, the other circumstantial argument related to NK comes from the Stone Dragon. They claim the Dragon Covenant, which was joined by the Firstborn Son, likely came down to Ash Lake. But I see no evidence of that. If by that they mean the Path of the Dragon Covenant, then that Covenant would probably give out Sunlight Medals and or other NK-related items, but it doesn't. And they wonder whether the blacksmith deity had befriended the dragons too, which would help place him in Ash Lake, given the presence of the stone dragon there. And they ask the question, but they don't really provide any evidence to support that idea. I think the evidence was supposed to have been the connection established by NK's bedroom, but, you know, we just talked about that. So without that, it's just a question, it's not a theory, right? And regarding his connection to Isolith, well, that one's going to be a bit complicated. I know they have an Isolith video, but I haven't watched it yet. So there will be a few arguments I won't be equipped to talk about. They do start with an odd choice though. As stated in the section's initial summary, they summon their Hephaestus analogy, point out he was married to a cheating goddess of love, whom they associate with Fina, 
and surmised that, since, according to their theories, Fina had dealings with Jeremiah, who was supposedly Isolith's husband, then the blacksmith deity and Isolith may have gotten together as a rebound from their respectively unfaithful spouses. And, rom-com jokes aside, their only reason to assume the blacksmith deity may have been married to Fina is Hephaestus. They don't provide any other arguments for this that I can see. That is their only reason, and that is not wise. I've said it before, outside sources aren't canon. Using one as the basis for a theory or argument is a dangerous shortcut. You can bend them any way you want to fit the lore, and you can also bend the lore to fit them as well. Let's take the blacksmith deity as a quick example. Earlier, they had cited Norse mythology in regards to the Yew Tree Room and the practices of this blacksmith. So, why not apply Norse mythology to the deity himself as well? For the sake of consistency. Like, the brothers Brock and Sindri are two dwarven blacksmiths from Norse mythology. Being dwarves is a good start, since they're not the same race as the gods they serve, just like the blacksmith deity they claim to be a giant and the gods of an Orlando. There's also the giant blacksmith we meet in the City of Gods to fill in the role as a brother as well, and these two blacksmiths crafted Gungnir, Odin's spear, which fits Gwyn's lightning spear's motif and Dragon Slayer's weapon of choice in general. Loki also bat his own head with these two blacksmiths, which fits the headless motif they're going for. So, why not these two instead of Hephaestus? It fits and it makes their own references more consistent. But the thing is, many bits of the game have multiple sources of inspiration, and you can never know which parts of any given source of inspiration may have made it in-game or not, and in which form. You can pretty much choose them arbitrarily to fit whatever theory you're building, since they don't require any in-game evidence other than this thing looks like that thing in real life, so everything else must be exactly the same. Which makes them unreliable at best and unfit to serve as the basis for any theories or arguments. If Hephaestus is their only argument for a relationship between Fina and the blacksmith deity, then, personally, I think they don't have an argument at all. Okay. Let's get back to the theory at hand. The other side of their spurred lovers theory is the relationship between Jeremiah and Isleaf. And unfortunately, I can't comment on this one since I haven't watched the associated video yet. What I can do is present a question for consideration. Maybe they've answered this on their video, in which case you can tell me about it in the comments below. In the video we're discussing today, they mention the smaller daughters of Isalith were the offspring of Jeremiah. But these daughters were around for the war against the ancient dragons. The same war where the first men fought meaning there weren't proper humans yet at that point in time. So, doesn't this mean Jeremiah couldn't have been their father? Since he's human and not a first man. I think it does, right? But again, if they've already addressed this point in their other video, then just please let me know about it. Now, Besides this whole distressed couples thing, they also mention the flowers again, which, again, I've already talked about in this very same video, and they also mention the placement of the respawning titanite demon in Lost Isolith. They argue these demons have all arisen in places the blacksmith deity had a deep connection to, 
saying, It is as though the residual elements of the nameless blacksmith deity's soul retain some resonance with places he was connected to. But I kinda have issues with the pattern they present here. The many that spawned in Saint's fortress, they assume is because a lot of smithing happened there, given the nature of the proving grounds and the likely high demand for weapons and armors. The one in the catacombs they waver between a slab have been held by one of his kin, or the proximity to a blacksmith, Vemus. But I think their theory needs it to be Vemus, because then it creates an explanation for the one in the undead parish, for which the only explanation they provide is that perhaps Andre had a titanized lab. But Sans is just a place he worked at, and the other two are places where other blacksmiths worked. None of them seem to me like they'd create the kind of connection that resonates with his very own soul. Especially the last two. And the one in Anorlondo is based on NK's room, but I just don't think that's NK's room. And I just don't think the connection they propose here exists at all. It seems to me like the placement of Titanite demons is quite random, actually. Saint's Fortress, for instance, has many of them not because it was the place the blacksmith deity was most deeply connected to, but rather just because it had a larger concentration of slabs and, therefore, a higher probability of hitting the titanite demon RNG jackpot. And the same goes for other places where blacksmithing took place, even if done by blacksmiths other than the deity. And so, I'd say the same randomness applies for the one in Lost Isolith as well. Remember that these labs are said to have been the domain of the gods, and also that Isolith was on good terms with Anorlondo up to a certain point, so it isn't strange they'd have possessed slabs of their own. Not to mention that, according to their theory, Ash Lake is both the place where he harvested the slabs these demons arise from, and the place of his demise too. If what they're proposing were true, that titanite demons arise in places where the blacksmith deity had a deep connection to, then wouldn't the lake have a high concentration of titanite demons as well? But, as it turns out, it has none. And lastly, they also draw attention to the fact titanite demons are called, well, demons. But then again, what are demons? As we've come to understand them, they are beings born from or transformed by the bed of chaos. Without chaos, there's nothing to differentiate them from any other type of creature in the game. In light of this fact, you can call something that doesn't fall under this definition a demon, but that won't make it a demon, such as with the Demon of Song or the Demonic Foliage, and also, I would argue, with Titanite Demons as well. Meaning, just because they are called Titanite Demons, doesn't make them any more connected to actual Chaos Demons than said Demon of Song or Demonic Foliage as well. Alright, so, the effort to place him in Ash Lake was done first through Titanites, but half of that was based on, not a mistranslation exactly, where it pertains to Twinkling Titanites being peeled from its lab, but a misinterpretation of the Japanese descriptions as a whole, and the other half on what I see as outside sources taken out of context, with the U3 rune. And both also fail to take Dark Souls 2 into consideration. 
Then there was the Nameless King connection, which was very speculative to begin with, since it would only work to place the deity in Nash Lake if he had befriended the dragons. And since I don't think their only direct connection, that being in case supposed bedroom is a valid one, then I don't think the NK connection can be used to support this idea. And finally, the connection to Isalif is meant to place the blacksmith deity in Ash Lake first due to the proximity between both locations. And also, through their theory he was a giant, since they argued that being a giant and given the size of the skull in Ash Lake, this deity becomes a likely candidate for being the father of Sisla's discharge. But the entirety of their disgruntled lover's theory seems based solely on the analogy to Hephaestus, which I personally find unacceptable. The placement of titanite demons and the fact they're called demons is a bit more open to interpretation, I think but definitely not solid enough to stand on their own. And regarding Sisley's discharge, we're gonna talk about that after the Crystal Lamber, with both being related to whether the blacksmith deity was a giant or not. About this Amber's description, I really need to start by saying that in Japanese there is no confusion about apostrophes. The Japanese description simply does not say giant god anywhere. So that whole discussion was basically for nothing. And in all fairness, they do offer a failsafe interpretation, drawing attention to the word blacksmiths being written in plural form, and saying that if all Anorlondo blacksmiths were giants, then it still makes sense for their god to be a giant too. But there are a couple of problems with that as well. First, it doesn't really make sense, not to me at least. Anorlondo gods are gods for all god-worshipping humans, but that doesn't mean Anorlondo gods have to be human as well. Likewise, even if all Anorlondo blacksmiths were giants, that doesn't mean Anorlondo's god of blacksmiths would have to be a giant as well. The god of blacksmiths can't just be a god. And second, we need to look at the Japanese description again, because from this description, there's no reason for them to have translated the word blacksmith in plural form. That's not to say they couldn't have, but I would argue they shouldn't have. You see, the way this description was written, both the words for God and blacksmith are in singular form. They could have added particles that would make them explicitly plural, but they didn't. So the first instinct is to read both as singular but they can still be read as plural if the context calls for it. Let's take the word for God as a first example. If this were a passage from the Bible, it would make sense for it to be read in its singular form, the giant blacksmith of God, since Christianity is monotheistic. But since the word of Dark Souls is polytheistic, then, according to its context, it makes more sense for it to be read in its plural form, of the gods, on account of the many gods in Anorlondo. Now, let's look at the context for the word blacksmith. There may have been other giant blacksmiths, but we never meet one, and we never hear about one either. As far as we know, that single giant blacksmith we meet is the only giant blacksmith of Anorlondo. So, since the Japanese word is written in singular, and since there is no context that would indicate it's meant to be plural, then it should be read in its singular form, meaning that phrase should have been translated as 
the giant blacksmith of the gods. And I must say, this isn't really circumstantial. The evidence regarding the crystal amber is pretty clear, in my opinion. And with that, let's turn our gaze back to Sisla's discharge. As mentioned before, the idea here is that, given the size of the skull in Ash Lake, if that were the skull of the blacksmith deity, then it makes sense for him to have been Sisla's father. And the problem here is that, if that were the skull of the nameless blacksmith deity at all, then that would just make him too damn big. I know this sounds silly again, but it actually isn't. We can make a rough estimate of how big this creature was by just standing next to it and using ourselves as a reference, then increasing our body size until our own head matches the size of the skull. Now, they had previously theorized the blacksmith deity may have done his blacksmithing out of an Orlando, a fairly reasonable assumption, given that it's a god making weapons for other gods. And back in section 1, when they were talking about lightning crossbow bolts, they also mentioned the locked room standing opposite to the room where the giant blacksmith works which they believe may have been where the blacksmith deity did his smithing back in the day. So let's use that as a backdrop for our experiment, shall we? Well, if the skull in Nash Lake belonged to this deity, then I think this is about how big he would have been. And that is a problem, isn't it? I mean, He's just too damn big now. Too big to be doing anything in an Orlando Sands Fortress or basically anywhere else with buildings in it. Added to that, there's also a problem regarding conceiving of ceaseless discharge. After the advent of the Chaos Flame, the Witch of Isalith became the Bed of Chaos meaning that, in order for her to have birthed Ceaseless, she'd have to have done so before she created that flame. Now, either Ceaseless was always this big, or his current size is the result of being deformed by chaos in its raging, uncontrollable initial stage. But the thing is, Going back to how big the blacksmith deity would have been if the skull in Ash Lake was his, then how is someone that big supposed to impregnate somebody as small as the Witch of Isolith was? She wasn't that much bigger than her daughters, right? And I'm not kink shaming anyone, it just seems physically impossible possible, you know? In this scenario, it's just more likely that Sisless wasn't always a kaiju, he became one after being affected by the Chaos Flame. And I'd also like to mention that we've seen skulls of giants before. There's plenty of them in the Tomb of Giants, and they look nothing like the one in Nash Lake. I honestly don't know what that thing is supposed to be, but it's not supposed to be a giant, and that's an observable fact. So, no, all things considered, I don't think that Skull belonged to the nameless blacksmith deity. It just seems too unfeasible to me. Okay, now, to round up this series of connections, they also propose connections between NK and Guinevere to Isalith. Regarding Guinevere and Isalith, the strongest argument is her marriage to a flame god. The divine blessings, not so much. 
and I say that because of the placement of the bodies holding the divine blessings. They're too far off the beaten path. They seem to me more like remnants of an Orlando's invading forces from back when they fought against the demons. But this is a very circumstantial analysis on my part regarding those bodies. And regardless, I'm not even against the basic premise of a connection between Guinevere and Isalif. I actually believe Guinevere to be Isalif's granddaughter, and not only that, but also that she eventually embraced pyromancy, among other things, in the kingdom she founded in the Drain Peninsula. If you want to know more about this theory, you can check out The Good, The Bad and The Rotten to learn about Guinevere's fate, and Bloodlines to learn more about the connection to Isalif. And so, with all things considered, a good standing relationship between these two goddesses seems very plausible to me. When it comes to the nameless king and Isadith, though, I just don't think the evidence would lend itself to the same conclusion. There's no indication N.K. ever stopped caring for his father and his father's legacy. His final farewell at Gwyn's coffin and the fact he wore a crown reminiscent of his father both attest to that. For their part, the Hawkshaw team presents three arguments to their conclusion. The painting in N.K.'s bedroom, the fact that sunlight maggots drop sunlight meadows, and that you can trade a sunlight maggot for the old witch's ring. Since I don't believe that room belonged to N.K., then the painting doesn't really work for me. But, even if that was his bedroom, I'd still not see that painting under the same light as they do. The focus of the painting isn't on Isalif, it's on the Sentinel. So, given the history between the two kingdoms, this painting is more likely celebrating the war against the demons rather than the kingdom of Isalif itself. The sunlight maggots are interesting, though. I don't agree with their conclusions, but it was good food for thought. We kinda start on the same page, since dropping sunlight meadows is a pretty clear indication they're connected to NK somehow. But let's dig a little bit further, shall we? The first question that came to my mind was whether these were originally NK-related creatures with a later connection to Isalif, or if they were originally creatures from Isalif with a later connection to NK. And considering there's only a handful of them in Isalif, that they can only be found in this particular spot, and that they're named after sunlight. Then I concluded they were foreign to this kingdom. They were originally related to NK and were brought here for some reason. Now, the other interesting thing about their placement is that they're divided in two groups each group on one side of a closed door. This indicates they were originally a single group that got divided. And since this door blocks a passage that leads directly into the heart of Isalif, then I believe they were brought here during the war against the demons. The door was shut after the invasion had started, and a brigade of warriors of sunlight was split by it. And, if this really was a traditional choice of fashion for old-school sunbros, that would even help shed some light on Solaire's questline. I mean, he wasn't looking for a literal sun, right? But he does end up in the only little spot in the entire game where you can find sunlight maggots. Maybe that's what he was after all along his very own son. And these bugs also make me think of the crown of the dark sun, and kinda go, aww, 
neuroses wanted to get Aniki's attention. And incidentally, all of this also helps us with this nugly exchange. Given the proximity of these maggots to the center of Isalif's kingdom, and that Sun Bros stand for jolly cooperation, and that the Witch's Ring enables dialogue with the Witches of Isalif, then I think that exchange represents the brokering of the truce that was eventually reached between Isalif and Anorlondo. Just real quick about Snuggly. I think this is all too circumstantial, and they say so themselves. And even though I too think there's some logic to these exchanges, I don't think there's a well-defined enough pattern to it that would allow us to use them as an argument. Not to mention, there's not enough information about Snuggly and its later counterparts themselves, which makes any conclusions regarding their trades a bit too speculative. And finally, the last point in this section. Other than Snuggly, the headless titanite demons as representative of a bodiless blacksmith deity's skull. Now, regarding the titanite demons and their missing heads. This is the foundational argument for this whole idea, I think. And it is a venue worth exploring. The general concept does constitute a reasonable question. But then we'd have to follow through with that question and see if it leads to a reasonable answer as well. Right? For completeness sake, I'll address their arguments connecting the titanite demons to the blacksmith deity, but honestly, I don't think there's any question there. They spawned from his labs when he died, so the existence of a connection is a given. Here, they use the titanite demon's lightning attacks to support their idea that he was related to Gwyn, and uh, I don't know where that idea comes from. It's probably been explained in another video, but it's also not really relevant to the theory at hand. So, just like Isalif and Jeremiah, I don't really feel the need to dig into it. I will say, though, that I think it's strange they mentioned the lightning attacks, but failed to factor in the magic damage into their equation. Like, they shoot lightning, but the catchpole itself scales with intelligence, and it deals magic damage so it's closer to sorcery. Just seems like something you might want to talk about if you're using damage types to establish connections. And they say those same catch poles resemble the tongs used by blacksmiths and yes, that seems like a reasonable assumption to me. They draw from their Hephaestus analogy again, pointing out he was lame of leg, and while that would be a good guess for a source of inspiration in the design of these creatures, using it to infer conclusions is a no-no, as I've said before. If they were to first establish their whole theory and then add these on top, that would be fine. But using it to draw conclusions meant to support the theory is a bad lore hunting practice, in my opinion. And lastly, that both the deity and the titanite demons do weapon stuff. Sure, I don't really see the point of pointing all these out, but sure, no problems there, they both do weapon stuff. Alright, as I said, the question of does the titanite demon's anatomy reflect the anatomy of the blacksmith deity is a valid question, but as I think I've shown, there's no real reason to conclude that it does. Without their interpretation of the crystal lamber, there's no reason to assume he was a giant. Most of their arguments placing the blacksmith deity in Ash Lake are also unfounded, and both the size and the design of the skull itself go against their theory. And without any of that, there's no real reason to assume a correlation between the headlessness of the titanite demons 
and the bodilessness of the Scully Nash Lake. This isn't even the only example of something like this in the series, right? We also get headless golems in Million Lois, after all. And having reached the end of this section, one thing I must say is that I'm not entirely opposed to the idea the blacksmith deity may have been involved with the Undead Rebellion. Not for any of the arguments made in this video, mind you. I've been toying with this idea for a while, but I've gotten to it from a completely different angle. What first led me to it is the fact that the weapons and armors of the first man were crafted in the Abyss, and since there's no evidence of an established human society at that time, especially considering they had to be given the Ringed City, then the blacksmith deity is the most likely candidate to have forged their gear. But then that would mean that, in order for him to have gained access to the Abyss, he'd have to have entered a covenant with the Primordial Serpents, just like Artorias did, which would also help explain how slabs would later appear in Grand Lake's deep layers of Earth, since they could be popping up from the Abyss, whose portals are historically depicted as being underground. Up to this point, I'm fairly certain everything scans. Then we'd need to figure out if he stood with the Rebellion or not. And at the moment, my answer is kinda. Like, he obviously worked for the gods to some extent, right? And he had entered a covenant with the serpents, apparently. And then there are the slabs and the titanite demons. The demons attack the undead on sight, and the one in an Orlando is just standing there. It isn't trashing the city of the gods, as would be expected if the deity was a diehard rebel. So that would kinda point to an allegiance to the gods. But he was made nameless though, and that is a clear indication of a fallout with the other gods. And then there's the message on his labs. According to Scarecrow's translation, it says something along the lines of The meek sought the divine in the trees. Yggdrasil, the tree of life, bestowed the gifts of plenty, joy and health. They remained in hardship setting. They found a spark, which turned into a sun, driving away the cold. Terrible trouble came. The sun ended this conflict. This age continued and began an era of wealth and plenty. Man will ascend, cold will return. So, right off the bat, this seems like pretty standard religious literature, right? Creation myth, apocalypse, ban. This also lets context to why these labs always seem kind of related to the worship of the gods. Everybody gets that impression, right? Or is it just me? If it's just me, then let me know and I'll try to formulate more formal arguments for it. Regardless, though, the really interesting thing about this prophecy is that it can be read as either a omen for evil or for good, depending on where you're coming from. If you're a god, this is a warning against the dark. But if, on the other hand, you just happen to be human, then this serves as pro-dark propaganda. So, taking all of this into consideration, the blacksmith deity always seems to be right smack in the middle of it. Whether he was a war profiteer, selling weapons to both sides, or an idealist craftsman who only cared about the forge. That's all up for a debate, and I think that's a debate worth having, if you ask me. Okay, but what about this code then? Well, like I said, I don't know what the hell that creature is supposed to be, and honestly, I think that's kind of the point. 
I think it's meant to give us the impression that there are older and fouler things than dragons in the deep places of the world. Or at least that's what I'll believe in until somebody can come up with a more conclusive explanation for it. Oh, and P.S. They say at one point, Smo is said to have ground the flesh and bones of his victims, this being an idiom for relatives. And I don't get it. How is victims an idiom for relatives? English isn't my first language, so if anybody can help me with this one, that would be greatly appreciated. Okay, this is the end of the third section for Rio now. And by this point, they have basically covered the entire main theory. They talk about Sif next, but as I had mentioned, Sif seems only slightly connected to the whole rebellion stuff. They make a few more points at the end that are more directly connected to the rebellion, but they saved those for last, and I shall respect that. We're in the final stretch now, so let's get right into it. They start this section by analyzing what Sif may have been feeling in the intro cutscene, and they don't provide an answer just yet, but they do draw attention to the fact Sif is crushing something in his hands, and also that Sif's overwhelming obsession is with immortality. Having plundered the primordial crystal from the dragons and subsequently devoting a lot of resources to the study of crystals. They also claim Sif tried to attain true immortality of the same kind once possessed by the ancient dragons. They remind us Sif was deemed insane and argue that may not have been the case. They say Sif's intentions would have been secret, and that may have spurred the rumors around the state of his mental health, and also that item descriptions would reflect the secrecy. To illustrate this point, they use the cage key as an example. Key to the hanging cage in Saint's Fortress. If a hapless adventurer becomes fatigued during an imprudent attempt to overcome the fortress, the Serpent Man will not kill him but lock him up in a lonely cage. Eventually, unless they have forgotten, they drag the victim off to who knows where. They then conclude that, since who knows where refers to Sif's location, Logan may have used this practice to bypass the track to the archives. At this point, they reveal their position regarding why Sif betrayed his king which they believe to have been to gain immortality, and how he may have tried to achieve it, which they believe to have been through its chaos of immortality. They speculate very quickly on what he may have intended to do after attaining said immortality, wondering whether he intended to kill all gods and humans alike and rule over the world, or whether he only sought death out of survival. Either way, they claim that Sif had a time limit. Now that dragons are going to die, Sif is inevitably going to die. So he took sides against the dragons, in order to steal their scales, in an effort to attain mortality for himself. They go back to the intro and claim Sif was feeling frustration at the uselessness of the scales after they had been peeled off. The silver lining, as they put it, is that he at least managed to attain the primordial crystal, which allowed him to survive up until we killed him. But alas, crystals are fragile things, and the primordial crystal can be easily destroyed. So they circle back and reaffirm their position that he sought immortality through the scales instead, while also pointing out that Without the presence of the most powerful gods of Anor Londo, an immortal Sith would be an indisputable king of Lordran and beyond. 
the in-dimension crystals are an obvious aspect of Sif's research and seem to insinuate it may have been to increase Sif's bond with the primordial crystal. But for the reasons already mentioned and the following arguments, they once again reiterate his focus was on scales, though. Since the number of dragons continually dwindled after the war, they also argue Sif strives to keep the gaping dragon safe as a specimen for experimentation. They make this case through the channelers, who they point out abduct Rhea and bring her to the archives, meaning their duty is still ongoing and, therefore, their placement is not random, from which they deduce the channeler overlooking the arena of the gaping dragon who also buffs that boss during our fight, corroborates their conclusion. At the end of this argument, they also propose said dragon may be coming up from Ash Lake. After the gaping dragon, they go back to Sif himself and talk about his albino condition for a little bit, commenting his lack of sight may be due to this condition, that he may not be fully blind, and also that an albino parent doesn't necessarily produce an albino offspring. G's last remark seems aimed at the age-old theory that Sif may have been Priscilla's father, since they mention her next, if only in passing. Here, they state she's supposedly half-dragon, that she seems to have scales on her forehead, that she was locked up by the gods and that she was also feared by Sif. Then they go back to the stone dragon, analyzing the description of the dragon greatsword, to assert that it wasn't a surviving ancient dragon from the Age of Ancients, but that it was a close descendant nonetheless. And they wrap this up by listing the connections between Sif and both the gaping and stone dragons one more time those being the Channeler, the Hydras and Crystal Golems, and also the Clams. Next, they turn their gaze back to the Maidens Sif had been kidnapping. They point out once again that this practice is still ongoing, albeit at a reduced rate, since Rhea is the only time we ever get to see it in action. They mention briefly some of the Pisakas may have been Maidens of Guinevere, and they talk about the giant Selkie, which shows they used to have countless maidens, but that their numbers have dwindled. And they speculate that, even though the key mentions mistakes, maybe there were some successes, which would explain why the number of maidens had dwindled, since there would be no more need for as many of them. They also contend that the behavior of the Serpent Man indicates they are actively trying not to hurt the Pisakas, since they run past us and up the staircase when we escape our cell. Here, they take a hard turn back to Priscilla. They find it strange that Sif doesn't experiment on her, or use her for whatever purpose she was created, and also that the gods would have probably allowed him to do so, or even if they didn't, Getting to her would likely be an easy task. And so they claim that the reason for it is that Sif isn't interested in a half-dragon, but only in a full dragon instead. Then they go through another rapid-fire list of arguments to recap their line of thought, citing that Sif is obsessed with immortality, Sif wants scales of immortality. Sif is scaleless, likely due to being albino. The albino condition is unlikely to pass down if only one parent is albino. Gaping dragon is also male. Maidens, often of the church, were captured en masse. The serpent men were trained not to harm the Pisaka. Priscilla resides nearby, but is of no interest to Sif. A maiden is defined as an unmarried girl, young woman or a virgin. And lastly, that the stone dragon is a small nested feather dragon in Ash Lake, and that Sif's definitely been there. And so they conclude, therefore, 
that Sif wants to create a full dragon, not a half dragon. And after the summary, they return to Priscilla. The conclusion now is that she was a mistake. The argument that leads to such a conclusion is that, according to the description of the peculiar doll, Priscilla didn't have a place in this world. Even her own creator didn't want her, as she represented a dangerous mistake. If she had had a purpose and had been created deliberately, and not by accident, then she certainly would have had a place. To explain how she came to be, they speculate Sif captured maidens to ensure they were virgins and therefore not pregnant. And since Priscilla is described as a bastard, then they conclude one of these maidens must have had a child out of wedlock, meaning she was already pregnant when Sif experimented upon her. And this pre-existing pregnancy is the only reason why he was successful in passing on his dragon DNA to a human child. They bring up a berserk reference to support this claim, saying, much like the corruption of Guts and Casca's child in Berserk, the dragon influence of Sif welded semi-successfully, changing the nature of the child. They explain why she's alive by saying it would be foolish to destroy her, since she was genetically unique, and why she's imprisoned by saying she feared her potential superiority, considering she could wield both the power of life hunt and humanity's weapons in addition to the natural gifts of the dragons. Then they use this alleged mistake, Priscilla, to justify Sif's obsession with maidens saying he favored church maidens to make extra sure they weren't pregnant, in order to avoid a second mistake, since two of them could start making some pretty strong babies that would threaten Sif's future. From here they theorize that, after this mistake, Sif succeeded in creating a full dragon, meaning the stone dragon. They point out that the number of maidens he experiments upon drops drastically and that he's clearly been to Ash Lake. And also that the stone dragon itself looks like a youth, mentioning it still has a smallish head to body ratio, it still has feathers and young partial fluff, and, most importantly, it sits right in the middle of a nest. That its infinite health indicates it was successful in attaining scales of immortality, and that it is female, since it not only sits in front of a bonfire named after it, but also that such a bonfire is kindled, which indicates a firekeeper, with firekeepers all being female, of course. And they claim the fact that it's female explains why Sif hasn't killed and harvested the stone dragon for its scales, since this girl dragon means Sif can personally rebirth the dragon race into existence, with Sif as the patriarch. They also say that since we can teleport to the stone dragon's bonfire, then maybe Gwendolyn knew about it, meaning maybe she told us to kill Sif in order to prevent the dragon repopulation process. That maybe Havel made the bonfire warpable, that maybe the dragon was already there when they got there, that maybe they were duped by Sif into protecting it. And they read the Japanese description of the dragon headstone. Living is a weakness, even the gods who are persons of fire are no exception. The goal of the transcenders is apparently to be different from life which they see as a link between the Dragon Covenant and the Rebels. And finally, they explain a theory meant to explain how the Stone Dragon may have been delivered to the Rebels in Nash Lake, saying its mother, one of Sif's maidens, may have been tricked into escaping, then watched over by the channelers, who snatched the baby dragon at the last moment. Wrapping it up by reiterating how clever it would have been of Sif 
to have Havo unwittingly watch over the stone dragon and hide it from the lords for him. Alright, it's analysis time. Their efforts here seem divided into what did Sif want, immortality and possibly rule over the world, and how did he want it, through the scales of immortality. And the how part is also divided into the maidens, the stone dragon, a side dish of Priscilla as a mistake, and a tie-in to Havel at the end. And before continuing, let me preface this by saying, I agree, Sif created the stone dragon. I'm saying this now because we'll only address it toward the end, and I want to avoid any confusion in the meantime. Now, let's start with the what, because it seems like the simpler of the two. Especially because I broadly agree with it. The game overtly implies the search for immortality may be Sif's main driving goal, and there's no reason to question that without any evidence to the contrary. Regarding the arguments they make in this category, when it comes to the intro and what Sif may have been feeling, that's very much subjective indeed. Personally, I don't see it as frustration. I see it as more of a mixture between elation and rage. But I also don't think there are any conclusive arguments that can be made here one way or another, so yeah. At one point, they talk about Sif's time limit, about how Sif had a time limit. Now the dragons are going to die. Sif is inevitably going to die. I'm not 100% sure what they're talking about here, to be honest. I think it might be something out of their timeline video, but regardless, I get the impression they might be referencing the disparities listed in the intro cutscene. As in, but then there was fire, and with fire came life and death and a bunch of other stuff too. And I feel like they're taking this quite literally to mean death wasn't a thing that existed in the universe, and then it was. Since I've heard this argument before elsewhere, and also that they mentioned the ancient dragon's true immortality, and how if now they're going to die, then that means they weren't going to before. But if that's really it, then I think that's a misinterpretation of the text. I really don't think that list of disparities was meant to be taken in its fullest, most literal sense. I mean, come on, we're not drags, right? Okay, so, if life and death are literal, then light and dark have to be literal too. But that can't be it, because dark is clearly related to the power of dark, as in what stems from and fuels both the abyss and the dark soul. But there's no light counterpart to that. If it were literal, then light would have to have been, I don't know, souls? Maybe fire? And light can't be literal, because that's not how light works. There were other sources of light, we could see the dragons. So life and death aren't to be taken at their most literal either. I mean, the dragons were alive, right? They were standing around like traffic cones because they had nothing better to do, but they weren't dead. Which would also negate a literal interpretation of death, by the way. They were alive, maybe the dragons weren't ever going to die of old age, which is a kind of immortality unto its own, albeit one that can never be fully tested. But that doesn't mean they couldn't be killed. That doesn't mean the concept of death, as it pertains to its possibility within the biological rules of this universe, didn't exist. 
It's like that age-old question. If a tree falls in a forest and no one is there to hear it, does it still make a sound? And I know that question is philosophical, but philosophy aside, the answer is yes. Yes, it does make a sound. Just because you can't observe it, or in this case, hear it, that doesn't negate the laws of physics. Same thing with life and death. Just because there aren't currently any observable examples of it happening in real time, that doesn't mean the rules of biology cease to exist. There wasn't anybody dying, but that doesn't mean death didn't exist. And also, it's kind of strange of them to say that now Sif is going to die because all dragons are going to die, if the only reason all dragons weren't going to die before is their scales. Considering Sif is scaleless, meaning Sif was always going to die regardless. And uh, oh my, that was a long rant, wasn't it? Well, the point of it being, if this is how they're interpreting the intro, then I don't agree with the idea of the first flame inventing death and putting a ticking clock on all dragons' natural life expectancy. Okay, let's get back on track here. We're still talking about what Sif wanted, and the other side of it is what was he going to do with his immortality. And the Hawkshaw team ponders whether he meant to just slaughter everyone and rule over the world. Or become the king of Lordran? And to that I say, sure, why not? There's really no indication past the point of, cool, I'm immortal now. There's really no telling what his next move was going to be. So, sure, King Sif, the one grafted with scales. In all honesty, why not? And with that, I think we can move on to the how of the matter. First, the idea that Sif's experiments weren't a matter of public knowledge is a well-established interpretation within the community, I think. But, it bears saying their analysis surrounding Big Hat Logan and the cage key is something I hadn't thought of myself, and it seems to be on point as well. They also make the case that, since the primordial crystal isn't a reliable source of immortality, then his main goal is to achieve that through the scales of immortality instead. And they present as evidence the theory Sif would have created the stone dragon to this very same end. I agree, Sif would have been looking for an alternative for the primordial crystal, for the same reasons they cited. It takes but as knees to break the crystal and undo Sif's immortality, after all. They also mention Sif's crystal research may have been to help with bonding and absorption, citing the crystal magic weapon's description which I take to mean he wanted to strengthen his bond with the primordial crystal. And that is also fine with me. Seems like a reasonable assumption and a link I hadn't made myself thus far. So, thanks, Hawkshaw team. The problem is that they believe he created the stone dragon and assume it has to be in order to attain immortality through its chaos. They assume that because they can't see an alternative to the scales, but I think there is one. That being what I call the crossbreed experiments. And we'll talk a little about that next when we talk about Priscilla. But I want to make a case against the scales of immortality, regardless of an alternative, before we get to that. The first thing is that their own arguments contradict their conclusions. Since they argue, Sif was frustrated in the intro because once peeled off, the scales were useless. Meaning even if Sif succeeded in creating more dragons, their scales would only benefit those new dragons. They would continue to be just as useless to Sif as they were when he was crushing them 
with his bare hands. And also since they apparently argued that the advent of the first flame had undone the immortality granted by those same scales as well, with the ticking time clock argument they made before. And the second thing is that the ancient dragons had already been defeated, their immortality had already been put to the test and it failed. It makes no sense to me that Sif would be striving to acquire the same kind of power that had led to their defeat in the first place. It seems to me like he'd be searching for a more permanent kind of immortality instead. Now, regarding crossbreed Priscilla, let me start by saying that, just like with the Chloranthi ring, they really should have taken the rest of the series into consideration here. And I say that because the presence of Yoshka and the Painter Girl clearly creates a pattern. There's a whole group of them out there. Not only that, but Yoshka is stated to be a part of Wind's family, and the Painter is hinted at being the daughter of Velka. Then we need to go back and take into consideration that old theory that Priscilla may have been Guinevere's daughter which is something they don't address in their video, but maybe should have. And something else they don't address in this context is Gwendolyn. Gwendolyn's got snake feet, people. Why doesn't anybody ever talk about Gwendolyn's snake feet? Gwendolyn is obviously a part of that same group. They're all crossbreeds. And apparently, they're all born from the highest caste of goddesses in an Orlando as well. And I think this is the whole crux of it. The gods knew the first flame was going to fade eventually, and the crossbreed experiments was an attempt to deal with that by creating a new race of gods that had the power of both the dark and the ancient dragons meaning they'd continue existing as everlasting gods, even after the Age of Fire had come to an end. And if Sif could apply those experiments to himself, that would ensure his survival as well. In that sense, Priscilla and the other crossbreeds weren't failures at all. But they were, indeed, well, aesthetically unpleasant, as Hawkshaw's video aptly points out. Surely, their apparent connection to the Dark didn't make them any more palatable to the other gods either. And there was the power of Life Hunt too, of course. Since Priscilla was sent away as a child, I can easily envision an incident involving the first manifestation of her powers and a hapless god from Gwyn's court falling victim to her lack of control over it prompting them all to be either hidden or sent away, instead of killed because, you know, family. And if you want more details about this theory, you can check out Of Gods and Monsters, my video talking about the crossbreed experiments. This alternative serves as a counter-argument to their claims she was a mistake. It also explains why Sif didn't further experiment on her. But let's look at some of their individual arguments, okay? The first one I'd like to address is a weird one, honestly. They claim the peculiar doll doesn't specifically state that it belonged to a child, so it's just as likely to have belonged to Priscilla's mother instead, that the only reason the community assumed it belonged to a child is because it's a doll, and, uh, well, yes, that's exactly why. I mean, it's a doll, of course we're going to assume it belonged to a child. That doesn't mean it couldn't have belonged to a grown-up, but G's second conclusion goes against the most reasonable assumption, and, therefore, the burden of proof is on their court now and they simply present no evidence for it whatsoever. I don't really understand what the purpose of this assumption is, or even where it's coming from. But 
they made the argument and I had to address it. Let's just move on, shall we? I'd also like to point out that the painted world isn't really a prison. Priscilla's prison was the Undead Asylum. The peculiar doll plainly states she was drawn into it, not caged in it. And the same goes for the other residents too. Everybody is always a forlorn drawn into the painting, not violently dragged into it. And in Dark Souls 1, we couldn't even get in without the doll, meaning that, in practice, the painting protected her from the gods and the outside world. The painted world was her safe haven. Not to mention that, for a prison, we can leave that place very easily and that Priscilla herself is the one guarding the exit. If the outside world ever became a place that had a place for her, making her not forlorn anymore, she could just jump down the same hole that got us out of there. Miyazaki also corroborates this notion in his Design Works interview by saying, I also think the painted world is a place where someone who's been chased might go to escape. And she fits that description. Gwyn had her exiled to the asylum instead of killed, and she was given the doll that would guarantee her escape into the painting. The presence of the Black Knight, still guarding her cell, and the fact even the painting guardians don't know why they're guarding the painting, shows the other gods of Anorlondo were none the wiser for it as well. Then, the painting itself was given a place of honor, in a room overlooked by a giant statue of Guinevere, Priscilla's mother. G's explanation counters their claims that the gods didn't care about her. Most didn't, some of the most important did. And also that it would have been easy for Sif to have gained access to her, since he didn't have the means to enter the painted world himself. Regarding the arguments they make related to the pre-existing pregnancy of Priscilla's mother, when they mention her being described as a bastard, they also mention Bastardy or illegitimacy may be a reference to royalty or godhood, as the word is often used to describe the sons and daughters of such people who are not entitled to inheritance. And I gotta say they're making a case for my theory here. Thanks, I guess. They do settle on the alternative of it not being related to royalty or godhood, but without their previous arguments, which I have rebutted, then there's no reason for it. You can choose to believe that it has nothing to do with royalty or godhood, but there's no weight to that choice. And they also make a berserk reference here, and uh... I don't think I have any problems with this one. Surprising, I know, right? I've had problems with their other usages of outside references, but this one isn't used as a foundational argument. They're not building their case on top of it. And I don't have to rail against it, since it doesn't negate my own conclusions. All I have to say is that this reference doesn't mean the mother in question had to have a pre-existing pregnancy. It only implies the obvious conclusion that Sif's DNA was part of the process that changed the nature of the child conceived through these experiments. Yay for common grounds. And that's it for Priscilla, I think. At this point, we've covered both why I think their opinions about her are not correct and why I think the scales of immortality make a poor choice for Sif's life goals. And we've also presented an alternative to both with the crossbreed experiments. So, let's talk about the Maidens now. According to their theory, Sif's capturing Maidens in order to impregnate them with dragons. Full dragons, as they call it. This isn't exactly a conclusion unto itself, but 
a link between their hypothesis that Sif wants scales of immortality and their conclusion that Sif created the stone dragon for this purpose. The stone dragon is used to justify the reason for these experiments and the dwindling number of maidens captured. And Priscilla, along with serving as an argument for the stone dragon's creation, is also used to justify why he focused specifically on maidens. They bring up a decreasing number of maidens by mentioning Rhea is the only example we see of one being kidnapped, and also through the description of the archive tower giant Selkie, which once imprisoned countless maidens. And then they use this argument to claim Sif had been successful in his experiments, stating they called the Pisaka's mistakes, but that maybe there weren't only mistakes, which means he would need fewer maidens in return. There's a few problems here, though. And they make a couple more arguments here, but we'll get to those in a bit. Regarding the number of maidens, first, the world is ending. There are just fewer maidens to be kidnapped. How many maidens other than Rhea do we even meet? Second, according to this theory, Sif's success was producing a full dragon. And he wants to make more. So, according to this theory, Sif's success means he'd need even more maidens now. So, he can impregnate them with baby dragons too. And finally, I think the word mistake was a bit of a mistranslation. Like, the Japanese word in question here is sotoshigo. So first, something that is lost in translation is the connection it creates to Priscilla. When Priscilla is called a bastard, they use fuginoko, which means precisely that, a child born out of wedlock that is, a bastard. And Otoshigo can have that meaning as well. It's the same word they use for Bloodborne's Bastard of Loran, for instance. Which creates both a connection through this shared meaning, while, at the same time, distinguishing Priscilla from the Pisakas, since it's not the same word. And the other thing is the second meaning the word Otoshigo can have which is the one they used for the Pisakas, that being of a consequence, a bad consequence, generally. So, the Pisakas aren't exactly a mistake, they're just the byproduct of Sif's experiments. A horrendous byproduct, sure, but not a mistake, which complicates their interpretation of this whole scenario, right? And that differentiation also helps with my previous arguments regarding Priscilla, since they could have used the same word for her, but chose to use the word that doesn't carry this particular interpretation instead, implying that, while she is in fact a bastard, she can still be considered a quote-unquote good byproduct of these experiments, to some extent. And now, the other couple of arguments they make about maidens. And I set these aside because I kinda agree with them here. They claim the Serpent Men are trained not to hurt the Pisakas, and also that Sif would have used these Pisakas to impregnate other women with what looks like a very unsanitary 10-foot needle. And yeah, these two are very good observations, actually. They both make complete sense to me. And the only thing is that I don't think they were impregnating people with full dragons. I think they were impregnating goddesses with half-breeds. And I'm probably going to incorporate that into my own theories now. All properly credited, of course. And thus we get to the stone dragon. Like I said before, I agree that this dragon was created by Sif. I agree the placement of the channelers isn't random, and that means one of them was keeping an eye on the gaping dragon, 
and I also agree the claims in the hydras indicate Sif's presence in Nash Lake. But there are a few differences in how we see this scenario, starting, of course, with the application for said dragon. As I've stated, I don't think it's likely Sif would be interested in skills of immortality as the final answer to his problems. And that applies to their theory he might be interested in recreating the race of dragons. Not only they had already lost the previous war against the gods, making them a very poor bet for world domination, but without a new permanent source of immortality, Sif would still be just the scaleless albino dragon amidst a bunch of scaleful ancient dragons. Or, at the very least, just one among many, without the qualifications to make him a certified ruler. Whether he's the patriarch or not, he'd just be back to square zero. And just as before, I think the lead he was chasing was the crossbreed experiments. And I think the stone dragon played a part in that research as well. The biggest hint of it, I find, comes from the dragon stones, which, in practice, produce temporary crossbreeds of humans and dragons, after all. These would have taken part in allowing the infusion of dark within their new godly breed, and eventually Sif as well. If his plans had survived their encounter with reality, that is. Besides that Gods and Monsters video I had mentioned about the crossbreed experiments, there's also the Book of Curses, which goes into more detail about some of the stuff related to the Stone Dragon, if you're interested in it, that is. And before moving on to the last bits of this section, I just wanted to say that their observation regarding the Stone Dragon's bonfire pointing out that it is apparently kindled, is very, very good. Like, really fucking good. And the idea of the stone dragon serving as its firekeeper is very interesting to me. On the surface, it serves to further corroborate the ideas I just proposed about using the stone dragon to bridge the gap between dragons and humans since firekeepers are glorified storage units for humanities, but I have a hunch that it might go deeper than that. Not sure yet, but, well, we'll see. For now, just kudos to Hawkshaw. Very well done indeed. And lastly, we get to the Hevel tie-in. Here, they pivot to Hevel, by saying since we can warp to the Stone Dragon's bonfire, then maybe Gwendolyn knew about it, and that maybe Hevel's the one who made it warpable. And to that, all I have to say is we can warp into the abyss. I have a whole thing going on in my first scene video that includes the Lord Vessel, its application and its creation. You can check that out if you'd like. But just the fact we can warp directly into the abyss should be enough to throw a solid range here, since Gwendolyn definitely wouldn't have been down there, and Hevel could have, but there's no indication that he did, meaning there's no reason their participation is required to make the Stone Dragon's bonfire warpable. Their conclusion is that maybe Hevel and the rebels were tricked by Sif, made to look after and hide the stone dragon from the gods, not knowing they were working for the Pale Drake all along. But all of that assumes the rebels had escaped to Ash Lake, which I have already argued against. They do present another argument connecting the Dragon Covenant and the rebels in this section of their theory, by presenting the Japanese description from the Dragon Headstone, saying Living is a weakness. Even the gods who are persons of fire are no exception. The goal of the Transcenders is apparently to be different from life. And, uh, um, I kinda need to point out that 
This is not the Japanese description for the Dragon Headstone. This is the Japanese description for the Dragon Eye. And they didn't even need to go to the source this time. They could have just read the English description. It's basically the same translation they made. To be alive is to be vulnerable, and the fiery gods are no exception. The apostles seek another plane of existence, which transcends life. But anyway, the thing is, I honestly don't see the connection they're trying to make here. Like, these apostles or transcenders clearly don't worship the gods. But to say, I don't worship you, somehow translates to I want you dead, is a bit of a stretch to me. They also disclose a theory explaining how the stone dragon may have been delivered to the rebels in Nash Lake, and they do say it's a wild, speculative theory, so, even though I'm going to argue against it, I do understand this doesn't necessarily reflect their collective official headcanon. So, what they propose here is that an undisclosed maiden, the stone dragon's mother, was tricked into escaping the archives. The arguments for it are the description of the extra key, that the serpent men are apparently trained not to harm the pisakas, and the siren they sound when we escape from our cell. They believe the key's description. Perhaps the serpent men were careless, for there are several keys scattered about, which fit archive tower cells. Actually means they were not careless, and these keys were left on purpose to trick the maidens into escaping. But why, though? We're mostly not maidens in distress, notwithstanding certain specific Souls fashion playthroughs, but they still left us with all our weapons and gear, and we escaped by killing and stealing the key from a serpent man literally sleeping on the job. I mean, I can respect a good commitment to the beat as much as anybody else, but this seems like a bit too much, doesn't it? That serpent guy was either careless, or he literally died just so we could get his key. I just don't think he would do that on purpose, you know? The description of the aforementioned cage key also kinda helps to corroborate that, since it's drawing attention to the fact serpent men sometimes just forget to bring prisoners to the archives not to mention the idea of tricking them into escaping and then keeping a channeler on their trail, waiting for the baby to be born, and then snatching it at the last moment, seems a bit, I don't know, cartoonish to me? Why take that chance? Why let maidens talk to the press about Sieve's kings, or run away to another kingdom, or miss the chance to snatch the baby? You've already been through the trouble of kidnapping and forcibly impregnating them. Just keep them around for a while and see what comes out of it. Like, literally. It's just the simplest and most reasonable explanation, I think. The siren and the running serpent man? That seems like devious experiments time protocol. It fits both arteries, really? I'm fine with that, but the rest of it just doesn't make any sense to me. Sorry, but, again, they did admit it themselves that this was speculation on their part. So, no need to linger on it, right? And this is it for this section. And I think they had some good insights on this one, but sadly, I think they were taken a bit out of context. I believe there are much simpler and or lore consistent alternatives that apply to these subjects. And just as it's happened before, maybe they'd have realized that if they had taken the whole series into account. Either way, the main bulk of their exploration is over, and all that's left for us 
is to talk about their closing theories. Here, at the end of the video, the Hawkshaw team presents us with a few extra theories. One regarding Hebel's family and hatred of Sif, one about Arstor, Earl of Karin, and the very last one about Sigmeyer and Sieglind. About Hevel, they start by asking why he hates Sif so much, pointing out that he couldn't have hated all dragons indiscriminately, that this would make him too unwise to have inspired faith from his followers and make him a leader. They also make notes saying he was probably either celibate or married, and that he was, in all likelihood, the Bishop of Law and Caste. From this last assertion, they also assume his wife would have been of high birth to match his caste, and then that he may have had children. Having laid the groundwork, they reveal to believe Rhea was Hevel's daughter. They point out she's from Torland, and if Hevel was the Bishop of Law and Caste, he'd have been a royal of Thorland. Or that Thorland was the home of the Way of White, and he was at least a Bishop of the Way of White. They take Petrus's words, the little madam is not worth her salt without her family name, to mean that Hevel and Rhea's family name was put to shame due to his involvement with the Undead Rebellion. In relation to this point, they also mention her dialogue when attacked, saying perhaps this is my punishment, to have the same effect of shame over the fall of her family's reputation. They draw attention to how she's described by Petrus, who calls her your highness and the youngest daughter of the good house of Thorland, meaning she's royal, just as the head bishop would be one of the foremost royals. Going back to her dialogue, they mention she says I have lost all those who are close to me, which could include Hevel, and that she also says the word father upon her death. The next connection comes from the fact she sells Magic Barrier, one of the only two miracles specifically created by Hevel. And they also talk about Great Magic Barrier, speculating it was a later development, and pointing out that only this iteration of the spell mentions Hevel's hatred of Sif. It is almost as though there has been a development in his magic and in the potential danger from Sif in the ensuing time since leaving Rhea. Following this by saying, Seath seems to take vindictive steps with Rhea, apparently mirroring Havel's hatred by stealing her away to the archives and via some sort of harsh treatment quickly causes her to go hollow. Having established Rhea as Havel's daughter, they then proceed to theorize Havel's hatred towards Seath was caused by Seath inadvertently killing his mistress. The arguments here are related to the White Sands Ring found in the archives. Looking at the corpse from which the ring is looted, they find it strange that a lowly maiden would be in possession of the ring of the head bishop, especially considering it's a man's ring. And so, they conclude it must have been given to her. Further still, they conclude Hevel gave it to her because she was his mistress, causing Hevel to swear vengeance upon Sif, and possibly also causing him to realize the terrible nature of the experiments being conducted in the archives, deepening his hatred of magic. Okay, so, they had started this theory by saying Hevel's hatred of dragons had to be specifically directed at Sif, because otherwise he wouldn't have been wise enough to lead and inspire his men. This is like, they all carry dragon teeth. There's a trophy room in an Orlando filled with drake heads, and Gwyn led pretty much everyone in a war of extermination against the dragons. Not to mention, they're all miracle casting priests. They don't need a reason to hate all dragons 
let alone a sorcery casting dragon living in their backyard. And also, you know, wisdom and hatred don't usually go hand in hand. You don't really need to be wise in order to inspire people to hate other people or to hate dragons. You know what I mean. I'm sorry for being blunt, but this argument simply doesn't make any sense to me. So, that little bit aside, this theory kinda makes sense on the surface, but it also kinda falls apart when you take Japanese descriptions into consideration. Like, first and foremost, even without the Japanese stuff, Hevo was a bishop, not the head bishop. They're not the same station. Saying Hevo was the head bishop because he was a bishop is like saying lieutenant and lieutenant general are the same thing because both have lieutenant in their ranks. That's not how ranks work. And a lot of this theory hangs on him being the head bishop, right? Being head bishop makes him royal enough to be Rhea's father, and also is the only connection leading to the corpse in the archives. And that alone should be enough to undo the reasoning in this matter, but there's also the Japanese stuff. From the original descriptions, we learn that both magic barrier miracles weren't created by Hevel, they were given to him. This already makes all connections made through them a bit weaker. Then, Magic Barrier's description says it was generalized for the convenience of the Way of White, giving simple warriors the means to deal with magic. The word generalized here means that it was watered down from Great Magic Barrier, so that lower rank warriors with less faith could use it too. This means first that Great Magic Barrier predates the Common Magic Barrier miracle, meaning their assumption that it's describing the rise of Hevel's hatred towards Sif in real time is invalid. And second, it means it's unlikely to have been given to Rhea by Hevel since it's a lower quality counterpart of the other miracle. She seems to have the required faith to cast the better version, considering the other miracles that she sells, so if it had been given to her by Hevel, he'd have given her the pre-existing Great Magic Barrier. And she also has the station necessary to acquire the better version, if she had the emotional attachment to want it on her for personal reasons. And lastly, Bishop is a very specific real-world religious rank, and they are always men. But Bishop in Japanese would be either Shukyo or Shikyo, depending on whether you're talking about Catholic, Orthodox or Anglican churches. Whereas the word used in these descriptions, Shisai, would be a priest in the same religions. And more importantly, this one is more interchangeable and generic than the Japanese word for bishop. Taking Dark Souls 1 as an example, this same word is used by the Dark Moon Seance Ring to describe the adherents of Gwendolyn, and it stands as the sage part of Demon Fire Sage as well. This means the gender of a high priest, which was translated as head bishop, doesn't have to be hard locked as male. As an example for this gender bit, we'll turn to Dark Souls 2, where this word is used to name the priestess set, which is specifically worn by women. So now, not only does the rank described by the White Sands Ring, found in the corpse they claim to have been of Hevel's mistress, differ from Hevel's own rank, the ring also doesn't have to have belonged to a man meaning it doesn't have to have been a gift, meaning it could have just belonged to her, meaning there's really nothing left to support this theory, I don't think. From my point of view, Petra's killing Rhea is the way of white purging the faithful, 
which you can hear more about in two podcasts I did on Sinclair lore. I'll leave links in the description. And regarding her lines of dialogue, the one about punishment is on account of her having failed her mission. The one about having lost everyone is probably about Nico and Vance. And her family name is obviously a great deal, so when she calls out to her father, it's either out of the shame of having failed him by having failed her mission, or yes, he may have died. But there's really no indication this is the case, and everything already works and clicks together without his death. So, there's really no reason to assume he died. And I'd like to say just one more thing here. That being that, there's nothing out of the ordinary about Sif kidnapping Rhea. He's Sif, and she's a maiden. There's no need to bring Havel into this story. That last theory wraps it up for Havel, and they start the next segment with a few more arguments related to the rebels' incursion into Nito's domain. Then they pivot to Arstor, who they believe to have been a rebel too. Regarding Nito, they bring up the effigy shield, which they think has a depiction of Vemus. A conclusion with which I disagree. I simply see no similarity between the figure on the shield and Vemus. The fin on the shield looks more like a xenomorph than Vemus to me, and they propose the deaths in Ito's domain may have happened at the same time as the deaths in Ash Lake, which I find strange since the other time they talked about Nito, they said the opposite. Earlier, their position was that there couldn't have been a battle in Dark Root at the same time the rebels were fighting in the Tomb of Giants. So, how do you square those two positions? I don't know, I just found it strange. After that, they briefly mention Ricard and Ada's again, but don't make any new arguments, so we can skip that, I think. Then they get to Arstor. Their argument for his involvement with the Rebellion is that the clams in Nash Lake and the Crystal Cave drop purging stones which Arstor would have brought to Ash Lake and that the clams would have swallowed. Much like the Twinkling Titanites. Perhaps from the lizards they have swallowed up that arose from the body of the nameless blacksmith deity. Another point they make concerns the stones being Arstor's secret. The reasoning is that, since the description doesn't explicitly state he shared the secret with anyone, then it could only have been made public at his death. They use Chester as an example, saying that even though he's likely from Karin and bears a curse plastered on his face, he does not sell or use purging stones, reinforcing how much of a secret the stones were, which they also use to place the fall of Ulasil prior to the rebellion. The undead female merchant is also mentioned, they point out she sells an unlimited supply of purging stones, contrasting that with Oswald, who only sells a handful. It is also noted that she sells moss clumps, dung pies and prism stones, which they associate with the track to Ash Lake, to conclude she's been there, which explains her unlimited supply and fits with their theory since, according to their arguments, if the secret of the purging stones had been passed down while the Earl was still alive, it would have been in a controlled fashion. But if it had come out when he died at the lake, then looters would most likely distribute it freely for financial gains. There's also a quick mention of her dialogue, claiming that when she says the gods above are watching you, it insinuates she might be a follower of Velka, much like the rebels were. And lastly, they point out that only someone important would be able to reach and erect the illusory walls of Honor Londo. And 
Wondering about dusk, they posit whether she was the master of the Ulasil magic of the plot. All right, first things first. I feel compelled to say that the presence of Arstor Spear in Dark Souls 3 implies he survived Dark Souls 1. It's not a categorical piece of evidence, but the implication is there. Now, regarding the purging stones, I think what's missing here is a broader perspective. I think they would have had to have asked themselves why there are clams and purging stones in both locations, Ash Lake and the Crystal Cave. Because the argument they're making only kind of explains the former, but not the latter. The way I see it, Sif is the biggest intersection at play here, and since he was conducting experiments in both the archives and the lake, then I think the purging stones were used in said experiments. And I have a whole very, very long thing about the nature of curses and the part they would have played in the crossbreed experiments in my Book of Curses video. But even if you don't know what that theory of mine is all about, the point I just made still stands. Hawkshaw's theory still needs to explain why Sif had clams and purging stones in the crystal cave, because their conclusion only plays out if the point of origin for these stones is the lake. But if they're also in the cave, then that may not be the case. And the case they make for the utmost secrecy of these stones also doesn't really work for me. Much like Vow of Silence and the Rite of Kindling, being a secret doesn't mean it is only known by a single individual. Chester was also not a good example, I think. Just like us, it's implied he was dragged from the future into Ulasu. Not only that, but from even farther into the future than the time at which our playthrough takes place. Meaning if their arguments are right, in whatever age Chester comes from, these stones wouldn't have been a secret anymore. And also because they say he's cursed and would need such stones, which is probably derived from the description of his top hat regarding his green, but that's a mask on his face, right? We get the same mask when we wear the top hat. You can even see it in the icon. And regarding the other tying to the secrecy stuff, the undead female merchant and her unlimited supply of purging stones. Just how many stones are they implying Arstor brought to Ashlake? A near infinite number of stones? Why would he even need a nearly endless amount of purging stones down in Ash Lake? It seems more plausible to me that she's making them. Like, she also has an unlimited supply of cursed limbs, right? And homeward bones too. Maybe she likes visiting New Londo, I don't know. Either way, it sounds like she gets her hands on a lot of corpses to me. A near endless amount of corpses, either floating in the sewers or down in New Londo, to produce a near endless amount of purging stones. And speaking of which, I also just wanted to point out that it's not strange for her to have either moss clumps or dung pies, since she does, in fact, live in the sewers. In the end, even though I disagree with these conclusions independently, I do think Arstor was tangentially connected to the rebellion, if not directly, at least the land of Karim, from whence he comes, seems to have been involved to some extent. And before we get to Sieglind, I wanna go back real quick to one of their quotes, the one about lizards arising from the corpse of the blacksmith deity. Just what is this? Did I miss something somewhere? I don't think they explained this anywhere in their theory. 
Is this something very obvious that they don't explain because everybody, except me, knows what it means? I am honestly baffled by this statement, and if you know what this is all about, then please tell me about it. And finally, the for reals' final piece of lore we're going to be talking about today, Sigmeier and Sieglind of Katarina. The idea here is that Sieglind and her mother were rebels too. Her mother is the corpse with the blue tearstone ring that was mentioned before. And, after she conveys her mother's last words to her father about the rebellion in Ashlake, he goes down there to see the works of his wife and her rebel clan. The first argument comes from their names, which comes from a saga about a man turning into a dragon. Then there's her dialogue, upon being released from the golem that holds her captive. She says she doesn't remember how she got trapped in the golem, but they argue it wasn't in that garden. If it had been, she'd remember it easily, since that's where they're standing. They also point out there's a pause, or a dot dot dot, after she says that, and claim she's hiding this information to keep Ashlake's location secret. Then, Sigmeier goes to Ashlake after having been told his wife's last words, and they remark that he doesn't ever go there unless we freed Sieglind, and also that Sieglind manages to find him in such an obscure location, even though, before, she only manages to find him in the mundane hub of the Firelink Shrine. They mention Sigmeier also wears a blue tearstone ring, just like that corpse. And finally, that she gives us a titanite slab, the heirloom of the nameless blacksmith deity. And epic music ensues. The end. And alright, time for our last analysis now. About their names in the Volsung Saga, which I don't really know how to pronounce the name of, I've made my position regarding outside references pretty clear by now, right? But their usage of it this time around was very responsible, I think. They don't build upon it, it's just a detail they mention to complement their theory, and so there's no need to disparage it either. Regarding her dialogue, saying she doesn't remember how she got trapped in the golem, they argue it couldn't have happened in the garden, and claim her elusiveness in this matter is meant to hide Ashlake's location. But I feel like their argument is a bit misleading here. Her dialogue isn't about where she was trapped, but rather about how she was trapped. I don't know how I ended up in that crystal. So, yes. If she had been trapped in the garden, then she'd probably remember that. But that's not what she's talking about. If the subject being discussed isn't about locations, then you can't fault her for not disclosing her previous location. I also think their dot 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 argument is a bit too speculative, but that's also a moot point, given what I just said. And we have a similar problem, when they say it's strange for her to have found him on her own. She keeps asking you to tell him to stay put, so she can find him. Well, he stays put in Ashlake, so she finds him. And Ashlake is remote, but so is Lost Isolith, the place where we last saw her father, and where she presumably went looking for him to deliver her mother's final words. This one isn't on the same level as the previous argument, about her location when she was trapped in the crystal golem, but both require a misinterpretation of the text in order to work. And remember this last theory as a whole needs the context of everything that came before it in order to work as well. It needs the blacksmith deity to have been a part of the rebellion and for the Skull in Ashlake to have belonged to him. It needs Havel to have escaped and 
he needs them all to have died in Ash Lake. But now, all my counter-arguments are also a part of that context. For instance, the Blue Tearstone Ring would have been a good connection, if everything else had worked. Just as Sieglind telling Sigmeier about Ash Lake would have been a valid assumption too, but from my perspective at least, since those other theories didn't work, then that failure automatically negates this theory as well. Not to mention, their explanation creates a few questions that would have to be answered. Like, if her mother was killed in a surprise attack and then her corpse was dragged by her assailant, who still watches over it to this day, then how did Sigling hear her mother's last words? And if she was there to hear them in the first place, then how did she survive the trap? And more importantly, why doesn't Sigmeier go to where she died? That really seems like the first place he'd go to, right? Especially considering how close to Firelink Shrine it is. What I think is more likely is that Ash Lake really was, quite literally, Sigmeier's final adventure. A sense of purpose keeps you moving forward, always abating Halloween for just one more day one day at a time. That was his final destination, the last place he had left to explore, and for as long as he had that, he'd have something to look forward to. He decided to take that last step after learning of his wife's death, probably back home in Katarina, and he told Sieglind where he'd go next. Then, down in Ash Lake, at the bottom of the world, he finally reached his lowest point. He had nothing left to look forward to, and he had nothing left to go back to either. And so he just hollowed. And remember when I mentioned how the slabs always seem associated with the worship of the gods and the prophecy that was written on it? Well, Sigmeier is the most overtly Gwyn worshipping human in the game. Dark Souls 3 Sigvard also gifts us with a slab, right? Hinting at a traditionally god-worshipping Katarina. And now that her father's gone, Sigilind just can't keep up her faith in the gods anymore. The slab is of no use to her now, so she takes the slab, this token of her faith, and just gives it away. Ah, oh my fucking god, that was a long video. Jesus Christ. Is there anybody still living out there? Well, if you're one of the two people who actually made it to the end of this video, then congratulations, you get the prize of listening to me scream in agony. <sighs> Well, I knew this was going to be a long video, their video is almost two hours long, but this is the theory I've been the most asked about, so I just kinda had to do it, right? Well, now it's done, and uh, I hope I have answered all of your questions. But if I haven't, then yes, you can still send me your questions about it. And if you're coming from Hawkshaw's channel, and if you think I've misrepresented any of their arguments, or if I misunderstood anything, or if I'm just wrong about something, you can let me know as well. And regardless of where you're coming from, I just want to take this opportunity to reiterate the fact that I am not fluent in Japanese. A lot of the arguments, both on my side and theirs as well, were very translation heavy. And uh, yeah, I'm not fluent in Japanese. I have been living here in Japan for almost two decades now. And... I get the chance to ask Japanese people about stuff when I have doubts, which 
kinda gives me an edge. But if you are willing and able to double check my translations, then have at it. And if you find something wrong with that, then please do let me know about it and I'll definitely look into it. And lastly, once again, if you haven't watched their video yet, then please, please, please do it. Despite my many disagreements with their theory, the Hawkshaw team has clearly put a lot of work into the making of their video, they clearly care a lot about the lore, so the least we can do is just watch their video and hear their full side of the story as well. All right, thank you all very much for watching, as always. A very, very big thank you to all of my patrons, John, Ethan Finlay, Sinclair Lore, Balan, Several Bats, Tyler Baldwin, and Chris, etc. Happy holidays to everyone, stay safe, and see you around.